Xenophon. Hellenica. Translated by Carlton L. Brownson. Book 5. 1. Such, then, were the doings of the Athenians and Lacedaemonians in the region of the Hellespont. Meanwhile Etionicus was again in Aegina, and although previously the Aeginitans had been maintaining commercial intercourse with the Athenians, still, now that the war was being carried on by sea openly, he, with the approval of the ephors, urged on everybody who so wished, to plunder Attica. Thereupon the Athenians, being cut off from supplies by the plunderers, sent to Aegina a force of hoplites and Pamphilus as their general, built a fortress as a base of attack upon the Aeginitans, and besieged them both by land and by sea with ten triremes. Teleutius, however, who chanced to have arrived on one of the islands in quest of a grant of money, upon hearing of this, that is, in regard to the building of the fortress, came to the aid of the Aeginitans, and he drove off the Athenian fleet, but Pamphilus succeeded in holding the fortress. After this Hyrax arrived from Lacedaemon as admiral. And he took over the fleet, while Teleutius, under the very happiest circumstances, set sail for home. For when he was going down to the sea as he set out for home, there was no one among the soldiers who did not grasp his hand, and one decked him with a garland, another with a fillet, and others who came too late, nevertheless, even though he was now under way, threw garlands into the sea and prayed for many blessings upon him. Now I am aware that I am not describing in these incidents any enterprise involving money expended or danger incurred or any memorable stratagem, and yet, by Zeus, it seems to me that it is well worth a man's while to consider what sort of conduct it was that enabled Teleutius to inspire the men he commanded with such a feeling toward himself. For to attain to this is indeed the achievement of a true man, more noteworthy than the expenditure of much money and the encountering of many dangers. As for Hyrax, on the other hand, he sailed back to Rhodes with the bulk of the ships. But left behind him in Aegina twelve triremes and Gorgopas, his vice-admiral, as governor. And after this it was the Athenians in the fortress who were besieged rather than the Aeginitans in the city, insomuch that the Athenians, by a formal decree, manned a large number of ships and brought back from Aegina in the fifth month the troops in the fortress. But when this had been done, the Athenians were again molested by the bands of raiders and by Gorgopas, and they manned against these enemies thirteen ships and chose Eunomus as admiral to command them. Now while Hyrax was at Rhodes the Lacedaemonians sent out Antalcidas as admiral, thinking that by doing this they would most please Tiribazus also. And when Antalcidas arrived at Aegina, he took with him the ships of Gorgopas and sailed to Ephesus, then sent Gorgopas back again to Aegina with his twelve ships, and put Nicolochus, his vice-admiral, in command of the rest. Thereupon Nicolochus, seeking to aid the people of Abydus, proceeded to sail thither. He turned aside, however, to Tenedos and laid waste its territory, and having obtained money there, sailed on to Abydus. Then the generals of the Athenians gathered together from Samothrace, Thasos, and the places in that region, and set out to aid the people of Tenedos. But upon learning that Nicolochus had put in at Abydus they then, setting out from the Chersonese as a base, blockaded him and his twenty-five ships with the thirty-two ships under their command. As for Gorgopas, on his voyage back from Ephesus he fell in with Eunomus, and for the moment took refuge in Aegina, reaching there a little before sunset. Then he at once disembarked his men and gave them dinner. Meanwhile Eunomus, after waiting a short time, sailed off. And when night came on he led the way, carrying a light, as the custom is, so that the ships which were following him might not go astray. Then Gorgopas immediately embarked his men and followed on in the direction of the light. Keeping behind the enemy so that he should not be visible or give them a chance to notice him, while his bosuns gave the time by clicking stones together instead of with their voices, and made the men employ a sliding motion of the oars. But when the ships of Eunomus were close to the shore near Cape Zosta in Attica, Gorgopas gave the order by the trumpet to sail against them. And as for Eunomus, the men on some of his ships were just disembarking, others were still occupied in coming to anchor, and others were even yet on their way toward the shore. Then, a battle being fought by moonlight, Gorgopas captured four triremes, and taking them in tow, carried them off to Aegina, but the other ships of the Athenians made their escape to Piraeus. After this Chabrias set out on a voyage to Cyprus to aid Euagras, with eight hundred peltastes and ten triremes, to which force he had also added more ships and a body of hoplites obtained from Athens. And during the night he himself, with his peltastes, landed in Aegina and set an ambush in a hollow place beyond the Heraclium. Then at daybreak, just as had been agreed, the hoplites of the Athenians came, under the command of Demerenitus, and ascended to a point about sixteen stadia beyond the Heraclium, where the so-called Tripergia is.
On hearing of this Gorgopa sallied forth to the rescue with the Aeginitans, the marines from his ships, and eight Sparshati who chanced to be there. He also made proclamation that all freemen among the crews of the ships should come with him, so that many of these also joined the relief force, each man with whatever weapon he could get. Now when those in the van had passed by the ambush, Chabrias and his followers rose up and immediately threw javelins and stones upon the enemy. And the hoplites who had disembarked from the ships also advanced upon them. Then those in the van, in Asmuk as they were not a compact mass, were quickly killed, among whom were Gorgopas and the Lacedaemonians, and when these had fallen the rest also were put to flight. And there fell about 150 Aeginitans and not less than 200 foreigners, aliens resident in Aegina, and sailors who had hurriedly rushed ashore. After this the Athenians sailed the sea just as in time of peace, for the Lacedaemonian sailors refused to row for Etionicus, even though he tried to compel them to do so, because he did not give them pay. After this the Lacedaemonians sent out Teleutius again to take command of these ships as admiral. And when the sailors saw that he had come, they were delighted beyond measure. And he called them together and spoke as follows, fellow soldiers. I have come without money, yet if God be willing and you perform your part zealously, I shall endeavour to supply you with provisions in the greatest abundance. And be well assured that, whenever I am in command of you, I pray just as earnestly for your lives as for my own. As to provisions, you would be surprised, perhaps, if I should say that I am more desirous of your being supplied than of being supplied myself, indeed, by the gods, I should prefer to go without food myself for two days than to have you go without for one. And just as my door was open in days past, as you know, for him to enter who had any request to make of me, so likewise it shall be open now. Therefore, when you have provisions in abundance, then you will see me also living bounteously, but if you see me submitting to cold and heat and night watching, expect to endure all these things yourselves. For I do not bid you do any of these things that you may suffer discomfort, but that from them you may gain something good. And Sparta too, he added, that Sparta of ours, fellow soldiers, which is accounted so prosperous, she be well assured, won her prosperity and her glory, not by careless idling, but by being willing to undergo both toils and dangers whenever there was need. Now you in like manner were in former days, as I know, good men, but now you must strive to prove yourselves even better men, in order that, just as we gladly undergo toils together, so we may gladly enjoy good fortune together. For what greater gladness can there be than to have to flatter no one in the world, Greek or barbarian, for the sake of pay, but to be able to provide supplies for oneself, and what is more, from the most honourable source. For be well assured that abundance gained in war from the enemy yields not merely sustenance, but at the same time fair fame among all men. Thus he spoke, and they all set up a shout, bidding him give whatever order was needful. In the assurance that they would obey. Now he chanced to have finished sacrificing, and he said, Come, my men, get dinner, just as you were intending to do anyway, and provide yourselves, I beg you, with food for one day. Then come to the ships right speedily, that we may sail to the place where God wills that we go, and may arrive in good time. And when they had come he embarked them upon the ships and sailed during the night to the harbour of the Athenians, now letting the men rest and bidding them get a little sleep, and now setting them at the oars. But if anyone supposes that it was madness for him to sail with twelve triremes against men who possessed many ships, let such a one consider Teleutius' calculations. He conceived that the Athenians were more careless about their fleet in the harbour now that Gorgopas was dead, and even if there were triremes at anchor there, he believed that it was safer to sail against twenty ships which were at Athens than against ten elsewhere. For in the case of ships that were abroad he knew that the sailors would be quartered on board their several ships. While with ships at Athens he was aware that the captains would be sleeping at home and the sailors quartered here and there. These, then, were the considerations which he had weighed before he sailed, and when he was distant from the harbour five or six stadia, he remained quiet and let his men rest. Then, as day was dawning, he led on and they followed. Now he forbade them to sink or harm any merchant vessel with their own ships, but if they saw a trireme at anchor anywhere, he ordered them to try to make her unseaworthy, and furthermore, to bring out in tow the merchant ships which were loaded, and to board the larger ones wherever they could and take off their people. Indeed, there were some of his men who even leaped ashore onto the dagma, seized merchants and owners of trading vessels, and carried them aboard the ships. He, then, succeeded in accomplishing these things. But as for the Athenians, some of them, upon hearing the uproar, ran from their houses into the streets to see what the shouting meant. Others ran from the streets to their homes to get their weapons, and still others to the city to carry the news.
Then all the Athenians, hoplites and horsemen, rushed to the rescue, thinking that Piraeus had been captured. But Telusius sent off the captured merchant vessels to Aegina and gave orders that three or four of the triremes should convoy them thither, while with the rest of the triremes he coasted along the shore of Attica and, in Asmach as he was sailing out of the harbour, captured great numbers of fishing craft and ferry boats full of people as they were sailing in from the islands. And on coming to Sunium he captured trading vessels also, some of them full of corn, others of merchandise. Having done all these things he sailed back to Aegina, and when he had sold his booty he gave the soldiers a month's pay in advance. He likewise from that time forth cruised round and captured whatever he could. And by doing these things he maintained his ships with full complements of sailors. And kept his soldiers in a state of glad and prompt obedience. And now Antalcidas returned with Tiribazus from the Persian capital, having effected an agreement that the king should be an ally of the Lacedaemonians if the Athenians and their allies refused to accept the peace which he himself directed them to accept. But when Antalcidas heard that Nicolochus with his ships was being blockaded at Abydus by Iphicrates and Diotimus, he went overland to Abydus. And from there he set out during the night with the fleet, after spreading a report that the Chalcedonians were sending for him, then he came to anchor at Bacote and remained quiet there. Now the Athenian forces under Demerenitus, Dionysius, Leonticus, and Phanias, upon learning of his departure, followed after him in the direction of Proconesus, and when they had sailed past him, Antalcidas turned about and came back to Abydus, for he had heard that Polyxenus was approaching with the ships from Syracuse and Italy, twenty in number, and he wished to join these also to his command. But soon after this Thrasybulus, of the Demicolitis, came sailing from Thrace with eight ships, desiring to unite with the other Athenian ships. And Antalcidas, when his scouts signalled to him that eight triremes were approaching, embarked the sailors on twelve of his fastest ships, gave orders that if anyone was lacking men, he should fill up his crew from the ships left behind, and lay in wait with the utmost possible concealment. Then, as the enemy were sailing past him, he pursued, and they, upon seeing him, fled. Now he speedily succeeded in overhauling the slowest of the enemy's ships with his fastest. But giving orders to the leaders of his own fleet not to attack the hindmost ships, he continued the pursuit of those which were ahead. And when he had captured them, those who were behind, upon seeing that the leaders of their fleet were being taken, out of discouragement were themselves taken even by the slower ships of Antalcidas, and the result was that all the ships were captured. And after the twenty ships from Syracuse had come and joined Antalcidas, and the ships from all that part of Ionia of which Tiribazus was master had also come, and more still had been manned from the territory of Ariobarzanes, for Antalcidas was an old friend of Ariobarzanes, and Pharnabazus had at this time gone up to the capital in response to a summons, this being the occasion when he married the king's daughter, then Antalcidas, the whole number of his ships amounting to more than. 80, was master of the sea, so that he also prevented the ships from the Pontus from sailing to Athens, and compelled them to sail to the ports of his people's allies. The Athenians. Therefore, seeing that the enemy's ships were many, fearing that they might be completely subdued, as they had been before, now that the king had become an ally of the Lacedaemonians, and being beset by the raiding parties from Aegina, for these reasons were exceedingly desirous of peace. On the other hand the Lacedaemonians, what with maintaining a garrison of one regiment at Lycium and another at Orchomenus, keeping watch upon their allied states, those which they trusted, to prevent their being destroyed, and those which they distrusted, to prevent their revolting, and suffering and causing trouble around Corinth, were out of patience with the war. As for the Argives, knowing that the Lacedaemonian ban had been called out against them, and being aware that their plea of the sacred months would no longer be of any help to them, they also were eager for peace. So that when Tiribazus ordered those to be present who desired to give ear to the peace which the king had sent down, all speedily presented themselves. And when they had come together, Tiribazus showed them the king's seal and then read the writing. It ran as follows, King Artaxerxes thinks it just that the cities in Asia should belong to him, as well as Clazomene and Cyprus among the islands, and that the other Greek cities, both small and great, should be left independent, except Lemnos, Imbros, and Syros, and these should belong, as of old, to the Athenians. But whichever of the two parties does not accept this peace, upon them I will make war, in company with those who desire this arrangement, both by land and by sea, with ships and with money. Upon hearing these words the ambassadors from the various states reported them to their own several states. And all the others swore that they would steadfastly observe these provisions, but that the bands claimed the right to take the oath in the name of all the Boeotians. Agesilaus, however, refused to accept their oaths unless they swore. 
just as the king's writing directed, that every city, whether small or great, should be independent. But the ambassadors of the Theban said that these were not the instructions which had been given them. Go then, said Agesilaus, and ask your people, and report to them this also, that if they do not so act, they will be shut out from the treaty. The Theban's ambassadors accordingly departed. Agesilaus, however, on account of his hatred for the Thebans, did not delay, but after winning over the ephors proceeded at once to perform his sacrifices. And when the offering at the frontier proved favourable, upon his arrival at Tegea he sent horsemen hither and thither among the Perioesi to hasten their coming, and likewise sent mustering officers to the various cities of the allies. But before he had set out from Tegea, the Thebans arrived with word that they would leave the cities independent. And so the Lacedaemonians returned home and the Thebans were forced to accede to the treaty, allowing the Boeotian cities to be independent. But the Corinthians, on the other hand, would not dismiss the garrison maintained in their city by the Argives. Agesilaus, however, made proclamation to these peoples also, saying to the Corinthians that if they did not dismiss the Argives, and to the Argives that if they did not depart from Corinth, he would make war upon them. And when, as a result of the fear which seized both peoples, the Argives departed and the state of the Corinthians regained its self-government, the authors of the massacre and those who shared the responsibility for the deed withdrew of their own accord from Corinth, while the rest of the citizens willingly received back the former exiles. When these things had been accomplished and the states had sworn that they would abide by the treaty which the king had proposed, thereupon the armies were disbanded and the naval armaments were likewise disbanded. Thus it was that this peace was established between the Lacedaemonians and Athenians and their allies. The first since the outbreak of the war which followed the destruction of the walls of Athens. Now while in the war the Lacedaemonians were no more than holding their own with their antagonists, yet as a result of the so-called peace of Antalcidas they gained a far more distinguished position. For by having become champions of the treaty proposed by the king and by establishing the independence of the cities they gained an additional ally in Corinth, made the Boeotian cities independent of the Thebans, a thing which they had long desired, and also put a stop to the doings of the Argives in appropriating Corinth as their own, by threatening to call out the ban against them if they did not depart from Corinth. 2. Since in all this matters had proceeded as they desired, the Lacedaemonians resolved, in the case of all among their allies who had been hostile during the war and more favourably inclined toward the enemy than toward Lacedaemon, to chastise them and put them in such a situation that they could not be disloyal. Firstly, therefore, they sent to the Mantineans and ordered them to tear down their wall, saying that they could not trust them in any other way not to take sides with their enemies. For they said they had noted not only that the Mantineans had been sending corn to the Argives when they themselves were making war upon that people, but also that sometimes, on the pretext of a holy truce, they had not served in the Lacedaemonian armies at all, and when they had fallen into line, had served badly. Furthermore, the Lacedaemonians said they were aware that they were envious if any good fortune came to them, and delighted if any disaster befell them. It was also common talk that the Thirty Years' Truce, concluded after the Battle of Mantinea, had expired this year, so far as the Mantineans were concerned. When, accordingly, they now refused to tear down their walls, the Lacedaemonians called out the ban against them. Now Agesilaus requested the state to relieve him of the command of this expedition. Saying that the city of the Mantineans had rendered his father many services in the wars against Messene, Agesipolis, therefore, led forth the ban, even though his father, Pausanias, was on exceedingly friendly terms with the leaders of the popular party in Mantinea. And when he had entered Mantinean territory, he first laid waste the land, but since even then they would not tear down the walls, he proceeded to dig a trench round about the city, with one half of the soldiers sitting under arms in front of the diggers to protect them, and the other half working. And after the trench had been completed, he then without risk built a wall round about the city. Learning, however, that the corn supply in the city was abundant, since there had been a good harvest the previous year, and thinking that it would be a grievous thing if it should prove necessary to burden both his state and its allies for a long period with campaigns. He dammed up the river which flowed through the city. And it was a very large one. Its outflow being thus checked, the water rose not only above the foundations of the houses but above those of the city wall. Then as the lower bricks became soaked and failed to support those above them, the wall began first to crack and then to give way. And the Mantineans for a time tried to prop it up with timbers, and sought contrivances to prevent the tower from falling, but when they were no longer able to resist the water, being seized with the fear that if any portion of the encircling wall fell they would become prisoners of war, they offered to agree to tear down their walls. 
The Lacedaemonians, however, said that they would not make peace with them except on condition that they should also dwell apart in villages. And they for their part, coming to the conclusion that it was necessary, agreed that they would do this also. Now the partisans of Argos and the leaders of the popular party expected that they would be put to death. But the father of Agesipolis obtained from him the promise that safety should be granted them as they departed from the city. Being sixty in number. So on both sides of the road, beginning at the city gates, stood the Lacedaemonians with their spears, watching those who were coming out. And although they hated them, nevertheless they kept their hands off them more easily than did the Mantineans belonging to the aristocratic party. Let this, then, stand recorded as a striking example of good discipline. After this the wall was torn down and Mantinea was divided into four separate villages, just as the people had dwelt in ancient times. And at first they were displeased, because they were compelled to tear down the houses which they had and to build others, but the owners of the landed property, since they not only dwelt nearer to their estates, which were round about the villages, but also enjoyed an aristocratic government and were rid of the troublesome demagogues, were pleased with what had been done. And the Lacedaemonians sent mustering officers to them, not singly, but one for each village. Moreover, they came from their villages for service in the Lacedaemonian army far more zealously than when they were under a democratic government. Thus ended the affair of the Mantineans, whereby men were made wiser in this point at least, not to let a river run through city walls. And now the exiles from Flyus, as they observed that the Lacedaemonians were investigating to see what sort of friends their several allies had proved to be to them during the war, thinking that it was an opportune time, proceeded to Lacedaemon and set forth that so long as they were at home in Flyus, the city had received the Lacedaemonians within its walls, and its people had gone with them on their campaigns wherever they led the way but that after the Flyasians had driven them into exile, they had declined to follow anywhere, and had refused to receive the Lacedaemonians, and them alone of all men, within their gates. When the Ephors heard these things, they decided that the matter deserved attention. Accordingly they sent to the city of the Flyasians and said that the exiles were friends of the Lacedaemonian state and had been exiled for no wrongdoing. They said further that they deemed it proper to effect their return from banishment, not by compulsion, but by voluntary consent of the Flyasians. Upon hearing this the Flyasians conceived the fear that if the Lacedaemonians made an expedition against them, some of the people within the walls would let them into the city. For not only were there many kinsmen of the exiles in the city, and people who were friendly to them for other reasons, but also, as is indeed usual in most cities, some desired a change of government and therefore wanted to bring back the exiles. On account, then, of such fears, the Flyasians voted to take back the exiles and to restore to them their undisputed property, those who had purchased such property to recover the price of it from the public treasury. And if any dispute should arise in any case between these purchasers and the exiles, it was to be settled by legal process. Thus ended, in its turn, this incident of the Flyasian exiles at that time. Then there came ambassadors to Lacedaemon from Acanthus and Apollonia, which are the largest of the cities in the neighborhood of Olynthus. And when the Ephors heard with what object they had come, they brought them before the Lacedaemonian assembly and the allies. Thereupon Clasians of Acanthus spoke as follows, Men of Lacedaemon and of the allied states, we think you are unaware that a great danger is springing up in Greece. To be sure, almost all of you know that Olynthus is the largest of the cities on the coast of Thrace. These Olynthians, in the first place, attached to themselves some of the cities with the provision that all should live under the same laws and be fellow citizens, and then they took over some of the larger cities also. After this they undertook, further, to free the cities of Macedonia from Amintas, king of the Macedonians. And when the nearest of them gave their allegiance, they speedily proceeded against those which were farther away and larger, and we left them already in possession of a great number of Macedonian cities, including especially Pella, which is the largest of the cities in Macedonia. We also had information that Amintas was withdrawing from his cities and had already been all but driven out of all Macedonia. The Olynthians, furthermore, sent to us and to the Apollonians and announced to us that if we did not present ourselves to join them in their campaigns, they would come against us. As for ourselves, however, men of Lacedaemon, we desire to live under the laws of our fathers and to be citizens of our own city, but unless some one shall come to our aid, it will be necessary for us also to be united with them. And yet at this moment they already have not less than 800 hoplites and far more than that number of peltastes, while as for horsemen, if we also become united with them, they will have more than 1,000. Again, we left ambassadors both of the Athenians and of the Boeotians already there. 
and we heard reports that the Olynthians on their side had voted to send ambassadors with them to these states in regard to the matter of an alliance. Now if so great a power is to be added to the present strength of the Athenians and the bands, take care, he said. Lest you find that situation no longer easy to handle. Furthermore, since the Olynthians are in possession of Potidaea, which is on the Isthmus of Palene, be sure that the cities included within Palene will also be subject to them. And let this fact also be a further evidence to you that these cities have come to fear the Olynthians mightily, that although they feel the utmost hatred toward the Olynthians, nevertheless they did not dare to send ambassadors with us to set forth these things. You should consider this question also, how you can consistently, after having taken care in the case of Boeotia to prevent its being united, nevertheless disregard the gathering of a much greater power, and what is more, a power which is becoming strong not by land only, but also by sea. For what indeed is there to hinder such expansion, seeing that the country itself possesses ship timber and has revenues from many ports and many trading places, and likewise an abundant population on account of the abundance of food? And further, mark you, they have for neighbours those Thracians who are under no king. They even now are paying court to the Olynthians, and if they should come under their sway, this also would be a great power added to the Olynthians. Then, if the Thracians were their followers, straightway the gold mines of Mount Pangium also would beckon to them. And there is not one of these things which we say which is not also said thousands of times among the people of Olynthus. As for their pride, how could one describe it? For the deity, perhaps, has so ordered it that men's pride should increase with their power. We, then, men of Lacedaemon and of the allied states, report that such are the conditions there, it is for you to deliberate as to whether they seem to deserve attention. But you must understand this also, that the power which we have described as great is not yet hard to wrestle with. For such of the cities as share in the citizenship of Olynthus unwillingly, these, I say, will quickly fall away if they see any opposing force presenting itself. If, however, they once become closely connected by reciprocal rights of intermarriage and of property, which have already been voted, and find that it is profitable to be on the side of the conqueror, even as the Arcadians when they go with you keep their own possessions safe and plunder those of others, then, it may be, this confederacy will no longer be so easy to break up. When these things had been said, the Lacedaemonians gave their allies permission to speak and bade them advise whatever course any one of them deemed best both for Peloponnesus and for the allies. Thereupon many, especially those who desired to gratify the Lacedaemonians, advocated raising an army, and it was decided that each state should send its proportionate contingent for an army of 10,000. Proposals were also made that any state which so desired should be allowed to give money instead of men, three Aeginetan obols per day for each man, while if any state normally furnished horsemen. Pay equal to that of four hoplites should be given for each horseman. And if any one of the states should fail to send its contingent to the army, the Lacedaemonians were to be permitted to find such state a state per day for each man. When these things had been decided upon, the Acanthians rose again and declared that while these measures were excellent, it nevertheless was not possible for them to be speedily carried out. They said it was better, therefore, that while this expedition was gathering, a commander should set out with all possible speed with a force from Vasidemon, of such size as could take the field quickly, and likewise from the other states, for if this were done, the cities which had not yet gone over to the Olynthians would take no step in that direction, and those which had been coerced would be less likely to continue in alliance with them. This plan also was adopted, and the Lacedaemonians sent out Eudamidas and with him emancipated helots and men of the Perioesi and the Syritans to the total number of about 2,000. Now Eudamidas on setting out requested the ephors to allow Phoebidas, his brother, to gather together all the troops assigned to him which were left behind and to follow after him, as for himself, when he reached the region of the Thracian coast, he sent garrisons to such of the cities as desired them, gained possession of Potidaea, which came over voluntarily, although it was already an ally of the Olynthians and making that city his base of operations, carried on war in the way one. Naturally would who had an inferior force. Then Phoebidas, after he had gathered together the remaining portion of Eudamida's troops, took them under his command and began his march. And when they arrived in the district of Thebes, they encamped outside the city, near the gymnasium. Now since the, the bands were divided by factions, it chanced that Ismenias and Leontiades, who were polemarchs, were at variance with one another and both of them leaders of their respective political clubs. Hence Ismenias, on account of his hatred for the Lacedaemonians, did not even go near Phoebidas. 
Leontiades, however, not only paid court to him in various ways, but when he had become intimate with him, spoke to him as follows, Phoebidas, it is within your power this day to render the greatest service to your fatherland, for if you will follow me with your hoplites, I will lead you into the Acropolis. And this once accomplished, be sure that Thebes will be completely under the control of the Lacedaemonians and of us who are your friends, whereas now, as you see, proclamation has been made forbidding any the ban from serving with you against the Olynthians. But if you join with us and accomplish this deed, we will at once send with you many hoplites and many horsemen, so that you will go to the aid of your brother with a large force, and while he is getting ready to subdue Olynthus, you will already have subdued Thebes, a far greater state than Olynthus. When Phoebidas heard this, he was filled with buoyant hopes. For he was a man with a far greater passion for performing some brilliant achievement than for life itself, although, on the other hand, he was not regarded as one who weighed his acts or had much practical wisdom. And when he had agreed to the plan, Leontiades directed him to set out on his way, prepared as he was to depart from Thebes. And when the proper time arrives, said Leontiades, I will return to you and act as your guide myself. Accordingly, while the Senate was in session in the portico in the marketplace, for the reason that the women were celebrating the festival of the Thesmophoria in the Cadmea, and while, in Asmach as it was summer and midday, the streets were entirely deserted, at this time Leontiades rode out on horseback to overtake Phoebidas, turned him back, and led him straight to the Acropolis. And after establishing Phoebidas there with the troops under his command, giving him the key to the gates. And telling him to let no one into the Acropolis unless he himself so ordered. He proceeded at once to the meeting of the Senate. And when he had arrived there, he spoke as follows, Be not at all despondent, gentlemen, because the Lacedaemonians are in possession of the Acropolis, for they say that they have not come as enemies to anyone who is not eager for war, as for me, since the law directs that a polemart shall have power to arrest any man who seems to be doing deeds which deserve death, I arrest Ismenias here, as an instigator of war. Therefore do you captains, and you who have been detailed with them, arise, seize this man, and lead him away to the place where you have been directed to take him. Now those who knew of the plan were of course present, obeyed the order, and seized Ismenias, but of those who did not know about it and were opponents of Leontiades and his party, some fled at once out of the city, fearing that they would be put to death, others withdrew at first to their homes, when they learned, however, that Ismenias was imprisoned in the Cadmea. Then all those who held the same views as Androclades and Ismenias retired to Athens, to the number of about three hundred. When these things had been accomplished, they chose another pole march in place of Ismenias, but Leontiades proceeded at once to Lacedaemon. There he found the ephors and the majority of the citizens angry with Phoebidas because he had acted in this matter without authorization by the state. Agesilaus, however, said that if what he had done was harmful to Lacedaemon, he deserved to be punished, but if advantageous, it was a time-honored custom that a commander, in such cases, had the right to act on his own initiative. It is precisely this point, therefore, he said, which should be considered, whether what has been done is good or bad for the state. Then Leontiades came before the assembly and spoke as follows, men of Lacedaemon, that the, the bands were hostile to you before what has now been done came to pass. You were wont to say yourselves. For you saw that they were always friendly to your enemies, and enemies to your friends. Did they not refuse to join you in the campaign against the Athenian commons in Piraeus, who were bitter enemies of yours, and did they not, on the other hand, march against the Phocians because they saw that you were well disposed towards them? Again, knowing that you were making war upon the Olynthians, they undertook to conclude an alliance with them, and you in those past days were always uneasily watching for the time when you should hear that they were forcing Boeotia to be under their sway, but now that this stroke has been accomplished, there is no need of your fearing the the bands, on the contrary, a brief message from you will suffice to secure from that quarter all the support that you may desire, provided only you show as much concern for us as we have shown for you. Upon hearing these words the Lacedaemonians resolved, so long as the Acropolis had been seized, to keep it garrisoned, and to bring Ismenias to trial. Accordingly they sent out as judges three Lacedaemonians and one from each of the allied states, whether small or great. And it was not until the court held its sitting that charges were brought against Ismenias that he was a supporter of the barbarians, that he had become a guest friend of the Persian satrap to the hurt of Greece, that he had received a share of the money which came from the king, and that he and Androclades were chiefly responsible for all the trouble and disorder in Greece. To all these charges he did indeed make a defence, but he failed to persuade the court that he was not a man of great and evil undertakings.
So he was pronounced guilty and put to death, as for Leontiades and his party, they held possession of Thebes and gave the Lacedaemonians their support in even more than was demanded of them. After these things had been accomplished, the Lacedaemonians with much more spirit set about dispatching the joint army to Olynthus. They sent out Teleutius as governor, and not only sent with him their own full contingent of the total 10,000 men, but also transmitted official dispatches to the various allied states directing them to follow Teleutius in accordance with the resolution of the allies. And all the states gave their hearty support to Teleutius. For he was regarded as a man not ungrateful to those who performed any service. While the the band state in particular, Inasmuch as he was a brother of Agesilaus, eagerly sent with him both hoplites and horsemen. Now he prosecuted his march with no great speed, his concern being rather to make the journey without doing any harm to the friends of his state and to collect as large a force as possible. He also sent word on ahead to Amintas and asked him not only to hire mercenaries, but likewise to give money to the kings in his neighborhood, that they might become allies, if he really wanted to recover his dominions. Furthermore, he sent to Derdas, the ruler of Elimia, pointing out to him that the Olynthians had already subdued the greater power, Macedonia, and would not let the lesser escape unless someone put a stop to their presumption. As a result of his doing these things he had a very large army when he arrived in the territory of his state's allies. And when he had come to Potidea, he proceeded from there with his army in order of battle into the enemy's country. Now on his way toward the city of Olynthus he neither burned nor cut down, believing that anything of this sort he should do would prove so many obstacles in his way both as he approached and as he withdrew, but he believed that when he should retire from the city it would be right to cut down the trees and put them in the way of anyone who might come against him from behind. And when he was distant from the city not so much as ten stadia, he halted the army, himself occupying the left wing. For in this way it fell to him to advance in the direction of the gate where the enemy issued forth. While the rest of the phalanx, made up of the allies, stretched away to the right. As for the horsemen, he likewise posted upon the right wing the Laconians, the the bands, and all the Macedonians who were present, while he kept by his own side Derdas and his horsemen. Numbering about four hundred, not only because he admired this troop, but also to do honour to Derdas, so that he should be glad he had joined the expedition. But when the enemy came and formed in opposing line beneath the city wall, their horsemen, massing themselves together, charged upon the Laconians and Boeotians. And they not only struck down from his horse Polycarmus, the Lacedaemonian commander of cavalry, and inflicted very many wounds upon him as he lay, but they also killed others, and finally put to flight the cavalry upon the right wing. Now as the cavalry fled, the infantry next them also gave way, and the whole army, indeed, would have been in danger of being defeated had not Derdas with his troop dashed straight for the gates of the Olynthians. And Teleutius also advanced to the attack with his troops in battle order. When the Olynthian horsemen perceived these movements, being seized with fear lest they should be shut out from the gates, they turned about and retired in great haste. Then Derdas killed very many of them as they rode past him. And the foot soldiers of the Olynthians also retired into the city, but not many of them were killed, because the wall was near. And when a trophy had been set up and this victory had fallen to Teleutius, then as he withdrew he proceeded to cut down the trees. Now after continuing the campaign through this summer he dismissed both the Macedonian army and the horsemen of Derdas, the Olynthians, however, on their side made frequent raids into the territory of the cities allied with the Lacedaemonians, and carried off booty and killed men. 3. At the very beginning of the following spring the Olynthian horsemen, about 600 in number, had made a raid into the district of Apollonia at midday and were scattered about pillaging, and it chanced that on that day Derdas had arrived with his horsemen and was breakfasting at Apollonia. When he saw the raid, he kept quiet, keeping his horses saddled and bridled and their riders fully armed. But when the Olynthians came riding disdainfully not only into the suburbs, but to the very gates of the city, then he dashed forth with his men in good order. And upon seeing him the enemy took to flight. But he, when once he had turned them to flight, did not stop pursuing and killing for ninety stadia, until he had chased them to the very wall of the Olynthians. It was said, indeed, that Derdas killed in this action about eighty horsemen. And from this day forth the enemy stayed more closely within their wall and cultivated only an exceedingly small portion of their land. As time went on, however, and Teleutius had led his army up to the city of the Olynthians in order to destroy whatever tree was left or whatever field had been cultivated by the enemy, the Olynthian horsemen issued forth and, proceeding quietly, crossed the river which flows by the city and held on their way towards the opposing army. And when Teleutius saw them, 
Being irritated at their audacity, he immediately ordered Clemonidas, the leader of the Peltastes, to charge against them on the run. Now when the Olynthians saw the Peltastes sallying forth, they turned about, retired quietly, and crossed the river again. The Peltastes, on the other hand, followed very rashly and, with the thought that the enemy were in flight, pushed into the river after them to pursue them. Thereupon the Olynthian horsemen, at the moment when they thought that those who had crossed the river were still easy to handle, turned about and dashed upon them, and they not only killed Clemonidas himself, but more than one hundred of the others. But Teleusius, filled with anger when he saw what was going on, snatched up his arms and led the hoplites swiftly forward, while he ordered the peltastes and the horsemen to pursue and not stop pursuing. Now in many other instances those who have pressed a pursuit too close to a city's wall have come off badly in their retreat. And in this case also, when the men were showered with missiles from the towers, they were forced to retire in disorder and to guard themselves against the missiles. At this moment the Olynthians sent out their horsemen to the attack, and the Peltastes also came to their support, finally, their hoplites likewise rushed out, and fell upon the Lacedaemonian phalanx when it was already in confusion. Their Teleusias fell fighting. And when this happened, the troops about him at once gave way, and in fact no one stood his ground any longer, but all fled, some for Spartlus, others for Acanthus, others to Apollonia, and the majority to Potidaea. As they fled in all directions, so likewise the enemy pursued in all directions, and killed a vast number of men, including the most serviceable part of the army. From such disasters, however, I hold that men are taught the lesson, chiefly, indeed, that they ought not to chastise anyone, even slaves. In anger, for masters in anger have often suffered greater harm than they have inflicted. But especially that, in dealing with enemies, to attack under the influence of anger and not with judgment is an absolute mistake. For anger is a thing which does not look ahead, while judgment aims no less to escape harm than to inflict it upon the enemy. When the Lacedaemonians heard of this affair, it seemed to them as they deliberated that they must send out no small force, in order that the pride of the victors might be quenched and that the efforts already made might not go for nothing. Having come to this conclusion, they sent out Agesipolis, the king, as commander, and with him, as they had sent with Agesilaus to Asia, thirty Sparsha T. There followed with him also many of the Perioesi as volunteers, men of the better class, and aliens who belonged to the so-called foster children of Sparta, and sons of the Sparsha T by helot women, exceedingly fine-looking men, not without experience of the good gifts of the state. Furthermore, volunteers from the allied states joined the expedition and horsemen of the Thessalians wished to become known to Agesipolis, while Amintas and Derdas took part with even greater eagerness than before. Under these circumstances it was that Agesipolis marched against Olynthus. Meanwhile the people of Phlius, partly because they had been commended by Agesipolis for giving him a large sum of money for his campaign and giving it speedily, partly because they thought that with Agesipolis abroad Agesilaus would not take the field against them and that it never would happen that both the kings would be outside of Sparta at the same time, boldly refused to grant any of their rights to the restored exiles. For while the exiles demanded that the questions in dispute should be brought to trial before an impartial court, their policy was to compel them to plead their cases in the city itself. And when the exiles asked what manner of trial that was, where the wrongdoers were themselves the judges, they refused to listen to them at all. Consequently these restored exiles came to Lacedaemon to present their charge against the state, and other people from home came with them, saying that many even among the citizens thought that the exiles were not receiving just treatment. But the state of Phlius, angered at this, fined all who had gone to Lacedaemon without being sent by the state. And those who were thus fined were afraid to return home, but remained and protested to the Lacedaemonians, saying, These men who are engaged in these high-handed proceedings are the men who have banished us and have also excluded you from their city, these are the men who are buying our property and resorting to high-handed measures so as not to give it back, and now these same men have contrived to have a fine inflicted upon us for coming here, so that in the future no one shall dare to come for the purpose of revealing what is going on in the state. And since it seemed that the Flyasians were really acting insolently, the ephors called out the ban against them. Now this was not displeasing to Agesilaus, for the followers of Podonymus had been friends of his father Archidamus and were at this time among the restored exiles, while the partisans of Procles, the son of Hipponicus, were friends of his own. And when, after the sacrifices at the frontier had proved favourable, he made no delay but proceeded on the march, many embassies met him and offered him money not to invade the country of Phlius. He replied, however, that he was not taking the field to do wrong but to aid those who were suffering wrong. 
Finally they said that they would do anything whatsoever, and begged him not to invade. He answered again that he could not trust to words, for they had proved false to their word in the previous case, but he said there was need of some deed that one could trust. And when he was asked what manner of deed this would be, he replied again, the same thing, said he, that you did before, and in doing which you suffered no wrong whatever at our hands. By this he meant giving over their Acropolis. As they refused to do this, he invaded their land and quickly built a wall of circumvallation around the city and besieged them. And when many Lacedaemonians said that merely for the sake of a few individuals they were making themselves hated by a state of more than 5,000 men, for the Flyasians held their assemblies in plain sight of the people outside the city just for the purpose of making the fact of their numbers evident. Agesilaus devised a scheme to meet this situation. Whenever any Flyasians came out of the city either from friendship or kinship with the exiles, he instructed the latter to form common messes of their own with such of the newcomers as were ready to undertake the army training, and to supply money enough for provisions, he also urged them to provide arms for all these people and not to hesitate to borrow money for this purpose. The exiles accordingly carried out his injunctions, and showed as a result more than a thousand men in splendid condition of body, well disciplined, and extremely well armed, so that the Lacedaemonians finally said that they had need of such fellow soldiers. Agesilaus, then, was occupied with these things. As for Agesipolis, he advanced straight from Macedonia and halted near the city of the Olynthians. And when no one ventured to come out against him, he then laid waste whatever part of the Olynthian country was left unravaged, and proceeding into the territory of their allied cities. Destroyed the corn. But tore one he attacked and captured by storm. While he was engaged in these operations, at midsummer a burning fever seized him. And since he had previously seen the sanctuary of Dionys at Aphetis, a longing took possession of him at this time for its shady resting places and its clear, cool waters. He was therefore carried thither, still living, but, nevertheless, on the seventh day from the time when he fell sick, he came to his end outside the sanctuary. And he was placed in honey and carried home, and received the royal burial. When Agesilaus heard of this, he did not, as one might have expected, rejoice over it, as over the death of an adversary, but he wept, and mourned the loss of his companionship, for the kings of course lodge together when they are at home. And Agesipolis was a man well fitted to converse with Agesilaus about youthful days, hunting exploits, horses, and love affairs. Besides this he also treated Agesilaus with deference in their association together in their common quarters. As one would naturally treat an elder. In the place, then, of Agesipolis the Lacedaemonians sent out Polybiades to Olynthus as governor. Now Agesilaus had already gone beyond the time for which the food supply in Flyus was said to suffice, for self-restraint in appetite differs so much from unrestrained indulgence that the Flyasians, by voting to consume half as much food as before and carrying out this decision, held out under siege for twice as long a time as was to have been expected. Furthermore, courage sometimes differs so much from cowardice that a certain Delphian, who was regarded as a brilliant man, taking to himself three hundred of the Flyasians, was able to hold in check those who desired to make peace, was able to shut up and keep under guard those whom he distrusted, and had the power to compel the masses of the people to go to their posts and by putting sentinels over them to keep these people faithful. Frequently also he would sally forth with the three hundred picked men and beat off the troops on guard at one point and another of the wall of circumvallation. When, however, these picked men with searching in every way could not find food in the city, thereupon they sent to Agesilaus and asked him to give them safe conduct for going on an embassy to Lacedaemon, for they said that they had resolved to leave it to the authorities of the Lacedaemonians to do whatever they would with the city. Agesilaus, however, angered because they treated him as one without authority, sent to his friends at home and arranged that the decision about flyers should be left to him, but nevertheless he gave safe conduct to the embassy. Then he kept guard with a force even stronger than before, in order that no one of the people in the city might escape. In spite of this, however, Delphian, and with him a branded desperado who had many times stolen away weapons from the besiegers, escaped by night. But when messengers arrived from Lacedaemon with word that the state left it to Agesilaus to decide as he thought best upon matters in Flyers. Agesilaus decided in this way, that fifty men from the restored exiles and fifty from the people at home should. In the first place, make inquiry to determine who ought justly to be left alive in the city and who ought to be put to death, and, secondly, should draw up a constitution under which to conduct the government, and until such time as these matters should be settled, he left behind him a garrison and six months' pay for those who composed it. After doing all this he dismissed the allies and led his citizen troops back home. 
and thus the affair of Flyus in its turn came to a conclusion, after a year and eight months. At this time also Polybiades compelled the Olynthians, who were in an exceedingly wretched state from famine, inasmuch as they got no food from their own land and none was brought into them by sea, to send to Lacedaemon to treat for peace, and those who went thither, being ambassadors with full powers, concluded a compact to count the same people enemies and friends as the Lacedaemonians did, to follow wherever they led the way, and to be their allies. Then after taking an oath that they would abide by this compact, they went back home. And now that success had to such an extent attended the efforts of the Lacedaemonians that the the bands and the rest of the Boeotians were completely in their power, the Corinthians had become absolutely faithful, the Argives had been humbled for the reason that their plea of the sacred months was no longer of any help to them, and the Athenians were left destitute of allies. While on the other hand those among the allies of the Lacedaemonians who had been unfriendly to them had been chastised. It seemed that they had at length established their empire most excellently and securely. 4. Now one could mention many other incidents, both among Greeks and barbarians, to prove that the gods do not fail to take heed of the wicked or of those who do unrighteous things, but at present I will speak of the case which is before me. The Lacedaemonians, namely, who had sworn that they would leave the states independent, after seizing possession of the Acropolis of Thebes were punished by the very men, unaided, who had been thus wronged, although before that time they had not been conquered by any single one of all the peoples that ever existed, while as for those among the the banned citizens who had led them into the Acropolis and had wanted the state to be in subjection to the Lacedaemonians in order that they might rule despotically themselves, just seven of the exiles were enough to destroy the government of these men. How all this came to pass I will proceed to relate. There was a certain Philidas, who acted as secretary to Archias and his fellow Polemarchs and in other ways served them, as it seemed. Most excellently. Now, this man went to Athens on a matter of business, and there met Melon, one of the the bands in exile at Athens and a man who had been an acquaintance of his even before this time. Melon, after learning of the doings of the Polemarch Archias and the tyrannous rule of Philippus, and finding out that Philidas hated the conditions that existed at home even more than he himself did, exchanged pledges with him and came to an agreement as to how everything should be managed. After this Melon took with him six of the fittest men among the exiles, armed with daggers and no other weapon, and in the first place proceeded by night into the territory of Thebes, then after spending the day in a deserted spot they came to the city gates, as if on their way back from the country, at just the time when the last returning labourers came in. When they had entered the city, they spent that night at the house of a certain Charon, and likewise spent the following day there. As for Philidas. Since the Polemarchs always celebrate a festival of Aphrodite upon the expiration of their term of office, he was making all the arrangements for them, and in particular, having long ago promised to bring them women, and the most stately and beautiful women there were in Thebes, he said he would do so at that time. And they, for they were that sort of men, expected to spend the night very pleasantly. Now when they had dined and with his zealous help had quickly become drunk, after they had long urged him to bring in their mistresses he went out and brought Melon and his followers, having dressed up three of them as matrons and the others as their attendants. He conducted them all to the anteroom adjoining the treasury of the Polemarch's building, and then came in himself and told Archias and his colleagues that the women said they would not enter if any of the servants were in the room. At that the Polemarch speedily ordered them all to withdraw. While Philidas gave them wine and sent them off to the house of one of their number. Then he led in the supposed courtesans and seated them one beside each man. And the agreement was, that when they were seated, they should unveil themselves and strike at once. It was in this way, then, as some tell the story, that the Polemarchs were killed, while others say that Melon and his followers came in as though they were revelers and killed them. After this Philidas took three of his men and proceeded to the house of Leontiades and knocking at the door he said that he wished to give him a message from the Polemarchs. Now it chanced that Leontiades had dined by himself and was still reclining on his couch after dinner, while his wife sat beside him, working with wool. And believing Philidas trustworthy he bade him come in. When the party had entered, they killed Leontiades and frightened his wife into silence. And as they went out, they ordered that the door should remain shut, and they threatened that if they found it open, they would kill all who were in the house. When these things had been done, Philidas took two of the men and went to the prison, and told the keeper of the prison that he was bringing a man from the Polemarchs who was to be shut up. And as soon as the keeper opened the door, they immediately killed him and released the prisoners. Then they speedily armed these men with weapons which they took down from the portico, and, leading them to the Amphium, ordered them to stand under arms. 
After this they immediately made proclamation to all the the bands, both horsemen and hoplites, to come forth from their houses, saying that the tyrants were dead. The citizens, however, so long as night lasted, remained quiet out of distrust, but when day came, and what had taken place was evident, then both the hoplites and the horsemen speedily rushed forth with their arms to lend aid. The returned exiles also sent horsemen to fetch the troops of the Athenians who were on the borders under two of the generals. And the latter, knowing the purpose for which they had sent out the horsemen, came to their aid. Now when the Lacedaemonian governor in the Acropolis heard the proclamation of the night, he at once sent to Plataea and Thespi for help. And the ban horsemen, upon perceiving that the Plataeans were approaching, went out to meet them and killed more than twenty of them. Then as soon as they had re-entered the city after this achievement, and the Athenians from the borders had arrived, they made an attack upon the Acropolis. Now when those in the Acropolis realized that they were few in number, and saw the spirit of all who were coming against them. For there were also offers of large prizes to those who should first ascend the Acropolis, being frightened in consequence of these things, they said that they would withdraw if the the bands would allow them to do so in safety, keeping their arms. And the the bands gladly granted what they asked, and after making a truce and giving their oaths let them go forth on these terms. As they were on their way out, however, the citizens seized and killed all whom they recognized as belonging to the number of their political foes. There were some, indeed, who were spirited away and saved by the Athenians who had come from the borders with their supporting force. But the the bands even seized the children of those who had been killed, whenever they had children, and slaughtered them. When the Lacedaemonians learned of these events, they put to death the governor who had abandoned the Acropolis instead of waiting for the relief force, and called out the ban against the the bands. Now Agesilor said that it was more than forty years since he had come of military age and pointed out that just as other men of his age were no longer bound to serve outside their own country, so the same law applied to kings also. He, then, on this plea would not undertake the campaign. It was not, however, for this reason that he stayed at home, but because he well knew that if he was in command the citizens would say that Agesilaus was making trouble for the state in order that he might give assistance to tyrants. Therefore he let them decide as they would about this matter. But the ephors, hearing the stories of those who had been banished after the slaughter in Thebes, sent out Cleombrotus. This being the first time that he had a command. In the dead of winter. Now the road which leads through Eleuthery was guarded by Chabrias with peltastes of the Athenians, but Cleombrotus climbed the mountain by the road leading to Plataea. And at the summit of the pass his peltastes, who were leading the advance, found the men who had been released from the prison, about 150 in number, on guard. And the Peltastes killed them all, except for one or another who may have escaped, whereupon Cleombrotus descended to Plataea, which was still friendly. Then after he had arrived at Thespi, he went on from there to Cynocephaly, which belonged to the the bands, and encamped. But after remaining there about sixteen days he retired again to Thespi. There he left Sphodrias as governor and a third part of each contingent of the allies, he also gave over to Sphodrias all the money which he chanced to have brought from home and directed him to hire a force of mercenaries besides. Sphodrias, then, set about doing this. Meanwhile Cleombrotus proceeded to conduct the soldiers under his command back homeward by the road which leads through Crucis, the troops being vastly puzzled to know whether there was really war between them and the the bands, or peace, for he had led his army into the country of the the bands and then departed after doing just as little damage as he could. While he was on the homeward way, however, an extraordinary wind beset him, which some indeed augured was a sign foreshadowing what was going to happen. For it not only did many other violent things, but when he had left Crucis with his army and was crossing the mountain ridge which runs down to the sea, it hurled down the precipice great numbers of pacuses, baggage and all, while very many shields were snatched away from the soldiers and fell into the sea. Finally many of the men, unable to proceed with all their arms, left their shields behind here and there on the summit of the ridge, putting them down on their backs and filling them with stones. On that day, then, they took dinner as best they could at Egosthena in the territory of Megara, and on the following day they went back and recovered their shields. After this all returned at once to their several homes, for Cleombrotus dismissed them. Now the Athenians, seeing the power of the Lacedaemonians and that the war was no longer in Corinthian territory, but that the Lacedaemonians were now going past Attica and invading the country of Thebes, were so fearful that they brought to trial the two generals who had been privy to the uprising of Melon against Leontiades and his party, put one of them to death, and, since the other did not remain to stand trial, exiled him.
but the bands, for their part, being also fearful in case no others except themselves should make war upon the Lacedaemonians, devised the following expedient. They persuaded Sphodrias, the Lacedaemonian governor at Thespiae. By giving him money, it was suspected to invade Attica, that so he might involve the Athenians in war with the Lacedaemonians. And he in obedience to their persuasions, professing that he would capture Piraeus, in asthma as it still had no gates, led forth his troops from Thespi after they had taken an early dinner, saying that he would finish the journey to Piraeus before daybreak. But he was still at Thria when daylight came upon him, and then he made no effort to escape observation, but on the contrary, when he had turned about, seized cattle and plundered houses. Meanwhile some of those who fell in with him during the night fled to the city and reported to the Athenians that a very large army was coming against them. So they speedily armed themselves, both horsemen and hoplites, and kept guard over the city. Now it chanced also that there were ambassadors of the Lacedaemonians in Athens at the house of Callias, their diplomatic agent. Etymocles, Aristolochus, and Asilus, and when the matter of the invasion was reported, the Athenians seized these men and kept them under guard, in the belief that they too were concerned in the plot. But they were utterly dismayed over the affair and said in their defence that if they had known that an attempt was being made to seize Piraeus, they would never have been so foolish as to put themselves in the power of the Athenians in the city, and, still less, at the house of their diplomatic agent, where they would most speedily be found. They said, further, that it would become clear to the Athenians also that the Lacedaemonian state was not cognizant of this attempt, either. For as to Sphodrias, they said they well knew that they would hear that he had been put to death by the state. They accordingly were adjudged to be without any knowledge of the affair and were released. But the ephors recalled Sphodrias and brought capital charges against him. He. However. Out of fear did not obey the summons, but nevertheless, although he did not obey and present himself for the trial, he was acquitted. And it seemed to many that the decision in this case was the most unjust ever known in Lacedaemon. The reason for it was as follows. Sphodrias had a son Cleonymus, who was at the age just following boyhood and was, besides, the handsomest and most highly regarded of all the youths of his years. And Archidamus, the son of Agesilaus, chanced to be extremely fond of him. Now the friends of Cleombrotus were political associates of Sphodrias, and were therefore inclined to acquit him, but they feared Agesilaus and his friends, and likewise those who stood between the two parties, for it seemed that he had done a dreadful deed. Therefore Sphodrias said to Cleonymus, It is within your power, my son, to save your father by begging Archidamus to make Agesilaus favourable to me at my trial. Upon hearing this Cleonymus gathered courage to go to Archidamus and begged him for his sake to become the saviour of his father. Now when Archidamus saw Cleonymus weeping, he wept with him as he stood by his side, and when he heard his request, he replied, Cleonymus, be assured that I cannot even look my father in the face, but if I wish to accomplish some object in the state. I petition everyone else rather than my father, yet nevertheless, since you so bid me, believe that I will use every effort to accomplish this for you. At that time, accordingly, he went from the public messroom to his home and retired to rest, then he arose at dawn and kept watch, so that his father should not leave the house without his notice. But when he saw him going out, in the first place, if anyone among the citizens was present, he gave way to allow them to converse with Agesilaus, and again, if it was a stranger, he did the same, and again he even made way for any one of his attendants who wished to address him. Finally, when Agesilaus came back from the Eurotas and entered his house, Archidamus went away without even having approached him. On the next day also he acted in the very same way. And Agesilaus, while he suspected for what reason he kept going to and fro with him, nevertheless asked no question, but let him alone. But Archidamus, on the other hand, was eager, naturally enough, to see Cleonymus, still, he did not know how he could go to him without first having talked with his father about the request that Cleonymus had made. And the partisans of Sphodrias, since they did not see Archidamus coming to visit Cleonymus, whereas formerly he had come often, were in the utmost anxiety, fearing that he had been rebuked by Agesilaus. Finally, however, Archidamus gathered courage to approach Agesilaus and say, Father, Cleonymus bids me request you to save his father, and I make the same request of you, if it is possible. And Agesilaus answered, For yourself, I grant you pardon, but how could I obtain my own pardon from the state if I failed to pronounce guilty of wrongdoing a man who made traffic for himself to the hurt of the state, I do not see. Now at the time Archidamus said nothing in reply to these words, but yielding to the justice of them, went away. Afterwards, however, whether because he had conceived the idea himself or because it had been suggested to him by someone else, 
he went to Agesilaus and said, Father, I know that if Sphodrius had done no wrong, you would have acquitted him, but as it is, if he has done something wrong, let him for our sakes obtain pardon at your hands. And Agesilaus said, Well, if this should be honourable for us, it shall be so. Upon hearing these words Archidamus went away in great despondency. Now one of the friends of Sphodrias in conversation with Etymocles, said to him, I suppose, said he, that you, the friends of Agesilaus, are all for putting Sphodrias to death. And Etymocles replied, By Zeus, then we shall not be following the same course as Agesilaus, for he says to all with whom he has conversed the same thing. That it is impossible that Sphodrias is not guilty of wrongdoing, but that when, as child, boy, and young man, one has continually performed all the duties of a Spartan, it is a hard thing to put such a man to death, for Sparta has need of such soldiers. The man, then, upon hearing this, reported it to Cleonymus. And he, filled with joy, went at once to Archidamus and said, We know now that you have a care for us, and be well assured, Archidamus, that we in our turn shall strive to take care that you may never have cause to be ashamed on account of our friendship. And he did not prove false to his words, for not only did he act in all ways as it is deemed honourable for a citizen of Sparta to act while he lived, but at Leuptra, fighting in defence of his king with Dane and the pole march, he fell three times and was the first of the citizens to lose his life in the midst of the enemy. And while his death caused extreme grief to Archidamus, still, as he promised, he did not bring shame upon him, but rather honour. It was in this way, then, that Sphodrias was acquitted. As for the Athenians, those among them who favoured the Boeotians pointed out to the people that the Lacedaemonians had not only not punished Sphodrias, but even commended him, for plotting against Athens. Therefore the Athenians furnished Piraeus with gates, set about building ships, and gave aid to the Boeotians with all zeal. The Lacedaemonians on their side called out the ban against the the bans, and believing that Agesilaus would lead them with more judgment than Cleombrotus, requested him to act as commander of the army. And he, saying that he would offer no objection to whatever the state thought best, made his preparations for the campaign. Now he knew that unless one first gained possession of Mount Citheron, it would not be easy to effect an entrance into the country of Thebes, he therefore upon learning that the Clitorians were at war with the Orchomenians and were maintaining a force of mercenaries, came to an agreement with them that their mercenary force should be turned over to him if he had any need of it. And when his sacrifices at the frontier had proved favourable, before he had himself reached Aegea he sent to the commander of the mercenaries at Cleta, gave them pay for a month, and ordered them to occupy Citheran in advance. Meanwhile he directed the Orchomenians to cease from war so long as his campaign lasted, indeed, if any state undertook an expedition against any other while his army was in the field, he said that his first act would be to go against that state, in accordance with the resolution of the allies. After Agesilaus had crossed Citheran and had arrived at Thespi, he made that his base of operations and proceeded against the country of the the bands. When he found, however, that the plain and the most valuable portions of their territory had been surrounded by a protecting trench and stockade, he encamped now here and now there, and, leading forth his army after breakfast, laid waste those parts of the country which were on his side of the stockade and trench. For wherever Agesilaus appeared, the enemy moved along within the stockade and kept in his front, for the purpose of offering resistance. And once, when he was already withdrawing in the direction of his camp, the cavalry of the the bands, up to that moment invisible, suddenly dashed out through the exits which had been made in the stockade, and inasmuch as the peltastes of Agesilaus were going away to dinner or were making their preparations for doing so, while the horsemen were some of them still dismounted and others in the act of mounting, the the bands charge upon them, and they not only struck down a large number of the Peltastes, but among the horsemen Cleas and Epicididas, who were Spartiate, one of the Perioesi, Eudicus, and some the ban exiles, such as had not yet mounted their horses. But when Agesilaus turned about and came to the rescue with the hoplites, his horsemen charged against the enemy's horsemen and the first ten-year classes of the hoplites ran along with them to the attack. But the ban horsemen, however, acted like men who had drunk a little at midday. For although they awaited the oncoming enemy in order to throw their spears, they threw before they were within range. Still, though they turned about at so great a distance, twelve of them were killed. But when Agesilaus had noted that it was always after breakfast that the enemy also appeared, he offered sacrifice at daybreak, led his army forward as rapidly as possible, and passed within the stockade at an unguarded point. Then he devastated and burned the region within the enclosure up to the walls of the city. After doing this and withdrawing again to Thespi, he fortified their city for the Thespians. 
There he left Phoebidas as governor, while he himself crossed the mountain again to Megara, disbanded the allies, and led his citizen troops back home. After this Phoebidas plundered the, the bands by sending out bands of freebooters, while by making raids he devastated their land. The, the bands, on their side, desiring to avenge themselves, made an expedition with their entire force against the country of the Thespians. But when they were within the territory of Thespi, Phoebidas pressed them close with his peltastes and did not allow them to stray at any point from their phalanx, so that the, the bands in great vexation proceeded to retreat more rapidly than they had advanced, and their mule drivers also threw away the produce which they had seized and pushed for home, so dreadful a panic had fallen upon the army. Meanwhile Phoebidas pressed upon them boldly, having with him his peltastes and giving orders to the hoplites to follow in battle order. Indeed, he conceived the hope of putting the, the bands to rout, for while he himself was leading on stoutly, he was exhorting the others to attack the enemy and ordering the hoplites of the thespians to follow. But when the horsemen of the, the bands as they retired came to an impassable ravine, they first gathered together and then turned to face him, not knowing where they could cross. Now the peltastes were few in number. The foremost of them were therefore seized with fear of the horsemen and took to flight. When the horsemen, in their turn, saw this, they applied the lesson they had learned from the fugitives and attacked them. So then Phoebidas and two or three with him fell fighting, and when this happened the mercenaries all took to flight. And when as they fled they came to the hoplites of the Thespians, these also, though previously they had been quite proudly confident that they would not give way before the, the bands, took to flight without so much as being pursued at all. For by this time it was too late in the day for a pursuit. Now not many of the Thespians were killed, but nevertheless they did not stop until they got within their wall. As a result of this affair the spirits of the, the bands were kindled again, and they made expeditions to Thespi and to the other cities round about them. The democratic factions, however, withdrew from these cities to Thebes. For in all of them oligarchical governments had been established, just as in Thebes. The result was that the friends of the Lacedaemonians in these cities were in need of aid. But after the death of Phoebidas the Lacedaemonians merely sent over by sea a pole march and one regiment, and thus kept Thespi garrisoned. When the spring came, however, the ephors again called out the ban against Thebes and, just as before, requested Agesilaus to take command. Now since he held the same views as before about invading Boeotia, he sent to the pole march at Thespi before even offering the sacrifice at the frontier and ordered him to occupy in advance the summit overlooking the road which leads over Citheran and to guard it until he himself arrived. And when he had passed this point and arrived at Plataea, he pretended that he was again going to Thespi first, and sending thither he gave orders that a market should be made ready and that the embassies should await him there, so that the, the bands guarded strongly the pass leading from Thespi into their country. But on the following day at daybreak, after offering sacrifices, Agesilaus proceeded by the road to Erythri. And after accomplishing in one day a two days' march for an army, he passed the line of the stockade at Scolas before the, the bands returned from keeping guard at the place where he had entered on the previous occasion. Having done this, he laid waste the region to the east of the city of the, the bands, as far as the territory of the Tanagrians, for at that time Hypatodorus and his followers, who were friends of the Lacedaemonians, still held possession of Tanagra. After this he proceeded to retire, keeping the wall of Tanagra on his left. Meanwhile the, the bands came up quietly and formed in line of battle against him on the hill called Old Woman's Breast, with the trench and the stockade in their rear, believing that this was a good place to risk a battle, for the ground at this point was a rather narrow strip and hard to traverse. When Agesilaus observed this, he did not lead his army against them, but turned aside and proceeded in the direction of the city. The, the bands. On the other hand, being seized with fear for their city, because it was empty of defenders, abandoned the place where they were drawn up and hurried toward the city on the run, by the road which leads to Potni, for this was the safer route. And it really seemed that Agesilaus' expedient proved a clever one, for though he led his army directly away from the enemy, he caused the latter to retire on the run, and while the enemy ran past, some of his pole marks with their regiments nevertheless succeeded in charging upon them. The, the bands, however, hurled their spears from the hilltops, so that Alapetus, one of the pole marks, was struck and killed, but in spite of that the, the bands were put to flight from this hill also. Consequently the Syritans and some of the horsemen climbed the hill and showered blows upon the hindmost of the, the bands as they rushed past them toward the city. As soon as they got near the wall, however, the, the bands turned about. And the Syritans, upon seeing them, fell back at a faster pace than a walk. Now not one of them was killed, nevertheless. 
but the band set up a trophy, because after climbing the hill the Siritans had retired. As for Agesilaus, when it was time for him to do so, he withdrew and encamped at the very spot where he had seen the enemy drawn up, then on the following day he led his army away by the road to Thespi. But since the Peltastes who were mercenaries in the service of the the bands clung boldly at his heels, and kept calling out to Chabrias because he was not doing the same, the horsemen of the Olynthians, for they were now serving with the Lacedaemonians in accordance with their sworn agreement, wheeled about and, once in pursuit of the Peltastes, chased them on up a slope and killed very many of them, for when going up a hill where the riding is good foot soldiers are quickly overtaken by horsemen. Now when Agesilaus had arrived at Thespi, finding that the citizens were involved in factional strife, and that those who said they were supporters of Lacedaemon wanted to put to death their opponents, of whom Menon was one, he did not allow this proceeding, but he reconciled them and compelled them to give oaths to one another, and then, this being accomplished, he came back again by way of Citheran, taking the road leading to Megara. From there he dismissed the allies and led his citizen troops back home. But the bands were now greatly pinched for want of corn, because they had got no crops from their land for two years, they therefore sent men and two triremes to Pegasi after corn, giving them ten talents. But while they were buying up the corn, Alcetas, the Lacedaemonian who was keeping guard in Aureus, manned three triremes, taking care that the fact should not be reported. And when the corn was on its way from Pegasi, Alcetas captured both corn and triremes, and made prisoners of the men, who were not fewer than three hundred in number. These men he then shut up in the Acropolis, where he himself had his quarters. Now since, as the story ran, there was a boy of Aureus, an extremely fine lad too, who was always in attendance upon him, Alcetas went down from the Acropolis and occupied himself with this boy. Accordingly the prisoners, observing his carelessness, seized the Acropolis, and the city revolted, so that thereafter the, the bands brought in supplies of corn easily. As the spring came on again, Agesilaus was confined to his bed. For when he was leading his army back from Thebes, and, in Megara, was ascending from the Aphrodisium to the government building, some vein or other was ruptured, and the blood from his body poured into his sound leg. Then as the lower part of his leg became immensely swollen and the pain unendurable, a Syracusan surgeon opened the vein at his ankle. But when once the blood had begun to flow, it ran night and day, and with all they could do they were unable to check the flow until he lost consciousness, then, however, it stopped. So it came about that after being carried back to Lacedaemon he was ill the rest of the summer and throughout the winter. The Lacedaemonians, however, when spring was just beginning, again called out the ban and directed Cleombrotus to take command. Now when he arrived at Citheran with the army, his peltastes went on ahead for the purpose of occupying in advance the heights above the road. But some of the bands and Athenians who were already in possession of the summit allowed the peltastes to pursue their ascent for a time, but when they were close upon them, rose from their concealment, pursued them, and killed about forty. After this had happened, Cleombrotus, in the belief that it was impossible to cross over the mountain into the country of the, the bands, led back and disbanded his army. When the allies gathered together at Lacedaemon, speeches were forthcoming from them to the effect that, through slackness in prosecuting the war, they were going to be worn out by it. For they said it was within their power to man far more ships than the Athenians had and to capture their city by starvation. And it was also within their power to transport an army across to Thebes in these same ships, steering for Phocis if they chose, or, if they chose, for Crucis. Influenced by these considerations, they manned sixty triremes, and Paul Lees was made admiral of them. And those who had conceived these views were not disappointed, for the Athenians were in fact as good as besieged, for while their corn ships got as far as Gerastus, they would not now venture to sail along the coast from that point, since the Lacedaemonian fleet was in the neighbourhood of Aegina, Ceos, and Andros. Then the Athenians, realising the necessity that was upon them, went on board their ships themselves, joined battle with Paulis under the leadership of Chabrias, and were victorious in the battle. Thus the corn was brought in for the Athenians. Again, while the Lacedaemonians were preparing to transport an army across the gulf to proceed against the Boeotians, the the bands requested the Athenians to send an expedition around Peloponnesus. Believing that if this were done it would not be possible for the Lacedaemonians at one and the same time to guard their own country and likewise the allied cities in their neighbourhood, and also to send across an army large enough to oppose themselves, the the bands. And the Athenians, angry as they were with the Lacedaemonians on account of Sphodria's act, did eagerly dispatch the expedition around Peloponnesus, manning sixty ships and choosing Timotheus as their commander. 
now since the enemy had not invaded the territory of Thebes in the year when Cleombrotus was in command of the army and did not do so in the year when Timotheus made his voyage, that the bands boldly undertook expeditions against the neighboring cities of Boeotia and recovered them a second time. As for Timotheus, after he had sailed round Peloponnesus he brought Corsera at once under his control, he did not, however, enslave the inhabitants or banish individuals or change the government. As a result of this he made all the states in that region more favorably inclined to him. The Lacedaemonians, however, manned a fleet to oppose him, and sent out Nicolochus, a very daring man, as admiral, and as soon as he sighted the ships under Timotheus, he did not delay, even though six of his ships, those from Ambracia, were not with him, but with fifty-five ships he joined battle with those under Timotheus, which numbered sixty. And at that time he was defeated, and Timotheus set up a trophy at Alizia. But when the ships of Timotheus had been hauled up and were being refitted, and meanwhile the six Ambraciate triremes had joined Nicolochus, he sailed to Alizia, where Timotheus was. And since the latter did not put out against him, he in his turn set up a trophy on the nearest islands. When, however, Timotheus finished refitting the ships which he had and had manned, besides, others from Corsera, the whole number of his ships now amounting to more than seventy, he was far superior to the enemy in the size of his fleet. But he kept sending for money from Athens, for he needed a great deal, inasmuch as he had a great many ships. Book 6. 1. The Athenians and Lacedaemonians, then, were occupied with these things. As for the, the bands, after they had subdued the cities in Boeotia, they made an expedition into Phocis also. And when the Phocians, on their side, sent ambassadors to Lacedaemon and said that unless the Lacedaemonians came to their assistance they would not be able to escape yielding to the the bands, thereupon the Lacedaemonians sent Cleombrotus, the king, across to Phocis by sea. And with him four regiments of their own and the corresponding contingents of the allies. At about this time Polydamas of Pharsalus also arrived from Thessaly and presented himself before the general assembly of the Lacedaemonians. This man was not only held in very high repute throughout all Thessaly, but in his own city was regarded as so honourable a man that, when the Pharsalians fell into factional strife, they put their Acropolis in his hands and entrusted to him the duty of receiving the revenues, and of expending, both for religious purposes and for the administration in general, all the sums which were prescribed in their laws. And he did, in fact, use these funds to guard the Acropolis and keep it safe for them, and likewise to administer their other affairs, rendering them an account yearly. And whenever there was a deficit he made it up from his own private purse, and whenever there was a surplus of revenue he paid himself back. Besides, he was hospitable and magnificent, after the Thessalian manner. Now when this man arrived at Lacedaemon he spoke as follows, men of Lacedaemon. I am your diplomatic agent and benefactor, as all my ancestors have been of whom we have any knowledge, I therefore deem it proper, if I am in any difficulty, to come to you, and if any trouble is gathering for you in Thessaly, to make it known to you. Now you also, I am very sure, often hear the name of Jason spoken, for the man has great power and is famous. This man, after concluding a truce with my city, had a meeting with me and spoke as follows, Polydamas, that I could bring over your city, Pharsalus, even against its will, you may conclude from the following facts. You know, he said, that I have as allies the greater number and the largest of the cities of Thessaly, and I subdued them when you were with them in the field against me. Furthermore, you are aware that I have men of other states as mercenaries to the number of six thousand, with whom, as I think, no city could easily contend. As for numbers, he said. Of course as great a force might march out of some other city also. But armies made up of citizens include men who are already advanced in years and others who have not yet come to their prime. Furthermore, in every city very few men train their bodies, but among my mercenaries no one serves unless he is able to endure as severe toils as I myself. And he himself, for I must tell you the truth, is exceedingly strong of body and a lover of toil besides. Indeed, he makes trial every day of the men under him, for in full armour he leads them, both on the parade ground and whenever he is on a campaign anywhere. And whomsoever among his mercenaries he finds to be weaklings he casts out, but whomsoever he sees to be fond of toil and fond of the dangers of war he rewards, some with double pay, others with triple pay, others even with quadruple pay, and with gifts besides, as well as with care in sickness and magnificence in burial. So that all the mercenaries in his service know that martial prowess assures to them a life of greatest honour and abundance. He pointed out to me, further, although I knew it before, that he already had as subjects the Mauritians, the Delopians, and Alcetas, the ruler in Epirus. Therefore, he said, what have I to fear that I should not expect to subdue you easily? 
to be sure, one who did not know me might perhaps retort, then why do you delay, instead of prosecuting your campaign against the Pharsalians at once? Because, by Zeus, it seems to me to be altogether better to bring you over to my side willingly rather than unwillingly. For if you were constrained by force, you, on the one hand, would be planning whatever harm you could against me, and I, on the other, should be wanting to keep you as weak as I could, but if it was through persuasion that you joined with me, it is clear that we should advance one another's interests to the best of our ability. Now I know, Polydamas, that your city looks to you, and if you make her friendly to me I promise you, he said. That I will make you the greatest. Next to myself, of all the men in Greece, and what manner of fortune it is wherein I offer you the second place, hear from me, and believe nothing that I say unless upon consideration it appears to you true. Well, then, this is plain to us, that if Pharsalus and the cities which are dependent upon you should be added to my power, I could easily become Tagus of all the Thessalians, and, further, that whenever Thessaly is under a Tagus, her horsemen amount to six thousand and more than ten thousand men become hoplites. And when I see both their bodies and their high spirit, I think that if one should handle them rightly, there would be no people to whom the Thessalians would deign to be subject. Again, while Thessaly is an exceedingly flat land, all the peoples round about are subject to her as soon as Ategus is established here, and almost all who dwell in these neighbouring regions are javelin men, so that it is likely that our force would be far superior in Peltastes also. Furthermore, the Boeotians and all the others who are at war with the Lacedaemonians are my allies, and they are ready to be my followers, too, if only I free them from the Lacedaemonians. The Athenians also, I know very well, would do anything to become allies of ours, but I do not think it best to establish a friendship with them, for I believe that I could obtain empire by sea even more easily than by land. To see whether my calculations are reasonable, he said, consider these points also. With Macedonia in our possession, the place from which the Athenians get their timber, we shall of course be able to construct far more ships than they. Again. Who are likely to be better able to supply these ships with men? The Athenians or ourselves, who have so many serfs of so excellent a sort. And who are likely to be better able to maintain the sailors, we, who on account of our abundance even have corn to export to other lands, or the Athenians, who have not even enough for themselves unless they buy it. Then as for money, we surely should be likely to enjoy a greater abundance of it, for we should not be looking to little islands for our revenues, but drawing upon the resources of peoples of the continent. For of course all who are round about us pay tribute as soon as Thessaly is under a tagus. And you certainly know that it is by drawing upon the resources, not of islands, but of a continent, that the king of the Persians is the richest of mortals, and yet I think that it is even easier to reduce him to subjection than to reduce Greece. For I know that everybody there, save one person, has trained himself to servitude rather than to prowess. And I know what manner of force it was, both that which went up with Cyrus and that which went up with the Gessilors, that brought the king to extremities. Now in answer to these statements I replied that while the other matters which he mentioned were worth considering, nevertheless for people who were friends of the Lacedaemonians to secede and go over to their enemies without having any charge to bring against them, this, I said, seemed to me to be impracticable. He thereupon, after commending me and saying that he must cling to me the more because I was that sort of a man, permitted me to come to you and say the truth, that he was intending to undertake a campaign against the Pharsalians if we did not yield to him. Therefore he bade me ask assistance from you. And if, said he, the gods grant that you persuade them to send a supporting force large enough to make war with me, so be it, he said, and let us abide by whatever may be the result of the war, but if it seems to you that they do not give you adequate assistance. Would you not justly be blameless thenceforth if you should follow the course that is best for your city? Which honours you? It is about these matters, then, that I have come to you, and I tell you the whole situation there as I myself see it and have heard it from his lips. And I believe that this is the case, men of Lacedaemon, that if you send thither a force such as shall seem, not to me only, but also to the rest of the Thessalians, large enough to make war upon Jason, the cities will revolt from him, for all of them are afraid of the lengths to which the man's power will go. But if you imagine that emancipated helots and a private individual as commander will suffice, I advise you to remain quiet. For, be well assured, the war will be against strong forces and against a man who is so sagacious a general that whatsoever he undertakes to accomplish, whether it be by secrecy, or by getting ahead of an enemy, or by sheer force, he is not very apt to fail of his object. For he is able to make as good use of night as of day, and when he is in haste, to take breakfast and dinner together and go on with his labours and he thinks it is proper to rest only after he has reached the goal for which he had set out and has accomplished the things that are needful. 
moreover, he has accustomed his followers also to the same habits. Yet he also knows how to satisfy the wishes of his soldiers when by added toils they have achieved some success, so that all who are with him have learned this lesson too, that from toils come indulgences. Again, he has greater self-control than any man I know as regards the pleasures of the body, so that he is not prevented by such things, either, from doing always what needs to be done. Consider, therefore, and tell me, as beseems you, what you will be able to do and intend to do. Thus he spoke. As for the Lacedaemonians, at the time they deferred their answer, but after reckoning up on the next day and on the third their regiments abroad, to see how many they numbered, and the regiments which were in the vicinity of Lacedaemon to be employed against the triremes of the Athenians and for the war upon their neighbours. They replied that at present they could not send him an adequate supporting force, and told him to go home and arrange his own affairs and those of his city as best he could. He, then, after commending the straightforwardness of the state, departed and he begged Jason not to force him to give over the Acropolis of the Pharsalians, his wish being that he might still keep it safe for those who had put it into his hands, but he gave his own children to Jason as hostages, with the promise not only to win over the city and make it his willing ally, but also to help in establishing him as Tagus. When, accordingly, they had exchanged pledges with one another, the Pharsalians at once observed peace, and Jason was speedily established by common consent as Tagus of the Thessalians. Having become Tagus, he assessed the contingents of cavalry and hoplites that the cities were to furnish, according to the ability of each. And the result was that he had more than 8,000 horsemen, including the allies. His hoplites were reckoned at not fewer than 20,000. And there were peltastes enough to be set in array against the whole world, for it is a task even to enumerate the cities which furnished them. Further, he sent orders to all who dwelt round about to pay the same tribute as had been fixed in the time of Scopas. Thus these events were proceeding to their issue, I now return to the point at which I digressed when I took up the story of Jason. 2. The Lacedaemonians, then, and their allies were gathering together in Phocis, and that the bands had withdrawn to their own country and were guarding the passes. As for the Athenians, since they saw that the, the bands were growing in power through their help and still were not contributing money for their fleet, while they were themselves being worn out by extraordinary taxes. By plundering expeditions from Aegina, and by guarding their territory, they conceived a desire to cease from the war, and sending ambassadors to Lacedaemon, concluded peace. Two of the Athenian ambassadors, acting in accordance with a decree of the state, sailed directly from there and gave orders to Timotheus to sail back home, in Asmac as there was peace, as he was sailing back, however, he landed in their country the exiles of the Zacynthians. And when the Zacynthians in the city sent to the Lacedaemonians and told them the sort of treatment they had received at the hands of Timotheus, the Lacedaemonians immediately deemed the Athenians guilty of wrongdoing, set about preparing a fleet again, and fixed the proportionate contingents, for a total of sixty ships, from Lacedaemon itself, Corinth, Leucas, Ambracia, Elis, Zacynthus, Achaea, Epidorus, Trozen, Hermion, and Halii. Then they put Nasippus in command of this fleet as admiral and directed him to look after all their interests in that part of the sea. And especially to make an expedition against Corsera. They likewise sent to Dionysius, pointing out that it was advantageous to him also that Corsera should not be under the Athenians. Nasippus, accordingly, as soon as his fleet had been gathered together, set sail to Corsera, and besides the troops from Vasidemon who served with him he also had no fewer than 1,500 mercenaries. Now when he had disembarked he was master of the country, laid waste the land, which was most beautifully cultivated and planted, and destroyed magnificent dwellings and wine cellars with which the farms were furnished, the result was, it was said, that his soldiers became so luxurious that they would not drink any wine unless it had a fine bouquet. Furthermore, very many slaves and cattle were captured on the farms. Afterwards he encamped with his land forces on a hill which was distant from the city about five stadia and situated between the city and the country so that he might from there intercept any of the Corsarians who might try to go out to their lands. Then he had the sailors from his ships encamp on the other side of the city, at a point from which he thought they would observe in good time any vessels that approached and prevent their coming in. In addition he also maintained a blockade at the mouth of the harbour when the weather did not interfere. In this way, then, he held the city besieged. When the Corsarians found themselves unable to get anything from their farms because they were overmastered by land, while on the other hand nothing was brought into them by water because they were overmastered by sea, they were in great straits. 
Accordingly, sending to the Athenians, they begged them to come to their assistance, and pointed out that they would lose a great advantage if they were deprived of Corsera, and would add great strength to their enemies, for from no other state, they said, except Athens, could come a greater number of ships or a greater amount of money. Further, Corsera was situated in a favourable position with respect to the Corinthian Gulf and the states which reached down to its shores. In a favourable position for doing damage to the territory of Laconia, and in an extremely favourable position with respect to Epirus across the way and the coastwise route from Sicily to Peloponnesus. When the Athenians heard these things they came to the conclusion that they must give serious care to the matter, and they sent out tessicles as general with about 600 peltastes and requested Alcetas to help to convey them across. Accordingly these troops were brought across by night to a place in the country of Corsera, and made their way into the city. The Athenians also voted to man sixty ships, and elected Timotheus as commander of them. But he was unable to man his ships at Athens, and therefore set sail for the islands and endeavoured to complete his cruise there, thinking that it was a serious matter to sail light-heartedly around Peloponnesus to attack ships with well-trained crews. The Athenians, however, believing that he was using up the time of the year which was favourable for his voyage, did not pardon him, but deposed him from his office and chose Iphicrates in his place. As soon as he assumed office, he proceeded to man his ships expeditiously, and compelled his captains to do their duty. He also obtained from the Athenians whatever warships were cruising here or there in the neighbourhood of Attica, as well as the Paralus and the Salamania, saying that if matters in Corsera turned out successfully, he would send them back many ships. And his ships amounted in all to about seventy. Meanwhile the Corsarians were suffering so greatly from hunger that on account of the number of the deserters Massipus issued a proclamation directing that whoever deserted should be sold into slavery. And when they kept on deserting nonetheless, at last he even tried to drive them back with a scourge. Those in the city, however, would not admit the slaves within the wall again, and many died outside. Now Massipus, seeing these things, and believing that he all but had possession of the city already, was trying innovations with his mercenaries. He had before this dismissed some of them from his service, and he now owed those who remained as much as two months' pay. This was not, so it was said, because he lacked money, for most of the states had sent him money instead of men, because it was an overseas expedition. Now the people in the city, observing from their towers that the enemy's posts were less carefully guarded than formerly, and that the men were scattered through the country, made a sally, capturing some of them and cutting down others. When Nasippus perceived this, he put on his armour and went to the rescue himself, with all the hoplites he had, and at the same time ordered the captains and commanders of divisions to lead forth the mercenaries. And when some captains replied that it was not easy to keep men obedient unless they were given provisions, he struck one of them with a staff and another with the spike of his spear. So it was, then, that when his forces issued from the city with him they were all dispirited and hostile to him, a situation that is by no means conducive to fighting. Now after he had formed the troops in line, Nasippus himself turned to flight those of the enemy who were in front of the gates, and pursued them. When, however, these came near the wall, they turned about, and from the tombstones threw spears and javelins upon the Lacedaemonians, meanwhile others sallied out by the other gates and in mass formation attacked those who were at the extreme end of the line. These latter, who were drawn up only eight deep, thinking that the outer end of the phalanx was too weak, undertook to swing it around upon itself. But as soon as they began the backward movement, the enemy fell upon them, in the belief that they were in flight, and they did not go on and swing forward. Furthermore, those who were next to them also began to flee. As for Nasippus, while he was unable to aid the troops which were hard-pressed, because the enemy was attacking him in front, he was left with an ever smaller number of men. Finally, all of the enemy massed themselves together and charged upon Nasippus and his troops, which were by this time very few. And the citizens, seeing what was going on, came out to join in the attack. Then after they had killed Nasippus, all straightway joined in the pursuit. And they probably would have captured the very camp, along with its stockade, had not the pursuers turned back upon seeing the crowd of camp followers, of attendants, and of slaves, imagining that there was some fighting ability in them. At this time, accordingly, the Corsarians set up a trophy and gave back the bodies of the dead under a truce. And after this the people in the city were stouter of heart while those outside were in the utmost despondency. For there was not only a report that Iphicrates was already practically at hand, but the Corsarians were in fact also manning ships. 
Then Hypermenes, who chanced to be Vice Admiral under Massipus, manned fully the entire fleet which he had there, and after sailing round to the stockade and filling all his transports with the slaves and the captured property, sent them off, he himself, however, with his marines and such of the soldiers as had been left alive, kept guard over the stockade, but finally they, too, embarked upon the triremes in great confusion and went sailing off, leaving behind them a great deal of corn, much wine, and many slaves and sick soldiers, for they were exceedingly afraid that they would be caught on the island by the Athenians. And so they reached Leucas in safety. As for Iphicrates, when he began his voyage around Peloponnesus he went on with all needful preparations for a naval battle as he sailed. For at the outset he had left his large sails behind him at Athens. Since he expected to fight, and now, further, he made but slight use of his smaller sails, even if the wind was favourable, by making his voyage, then, with the oar, he kept his men in better condition of body and caused the ships to go faster. Furthermore, whenever the expedition was going to take the noonday or the evening meal at any particular spot, he would often draw back the head of the column from the shore opposite the place in question, then he would turn the line around again, cause the triremes to head toward the land, and start them off at a signal to race to the shore. It was counted a great prize of victory to be the first to get water or anything else they needed, and the first to get their meal. On the other hand, those who reached the shore last incurred a great penalty in that they came off worse in all these points, and in the fact that they had to put to sea again at the same time as the rest when the signal was given. For the result was that those who came in first did everything at their leisure. While those who came in last had to hurry. Again, in setting watches, if he chanced to be taking the midday meal in a hostile country, he posted some on the land, as is proper, but besides he hoisted the masts on the ships and had men keep watch from their tops. These men, therefore, could see much farther, from their higher point of view, than those on the level. Further, wherever he dined or slept, he would not have a fire inside the camp during the night, but kept a light burning in front of his forces, so that no one could approach unobserved. Frequently, however, if it was good weather, he would put to sea again immediately after dining, and if there was a favourable breeze, they sailed and rested at the same time, while if it was necessary to row, he rested the sailors by turns. Again, when he sailed by day, he would lead the fleet, by signals, at one time in column and at another in line of battle, so that, while still pursuing their voyage. They had at the same time practised and become skilled in all the manoeuvres of battle before they reached the sea which as they supposed, was held by the enemy. And although for the most part they took both their noonday and their evening meals in the enemy's country, nevertheless, by doing only the necessary things, he always got to sea before the enemy's forces arrived to repel him and speedily got under way again. At the time of Nasipus' death Iphicrates chanced to be near the Sphagii. Then, after reaching Elis and sailing past the mouth of the Alpheus, he anchored beneath the promontory called Itches. From there he put to sea on the following day for Cephalenia, having his fleet in such order and making the voyage in such a way that, if it should be necessary to fight, he should be ready in all essential respects to do so. For he had not heard the news of Nasippus' death from any eyewitness, but suspected that it was told to deceive him, and hence was on his guard, when he arrived at Cephalenia, however, he there got definite information, and so rested his forces. Now I am aware that all these matters of practice and training are customary whenever men expect to engage in a battle by sea. But that which I commend in Iphicrates is this, that when it was incumbent upon him to arrive speedily at the place where he supposed he should fight with the enemy, he discovered a way to keep his men from being either, by reason of the voyage they had made, unskilled in the tactics of fighting at sea, or, by reason of their having been trained in such tactics, any the more tardy in arriving at their destination. After subduing the cities in Cephalenia he sailed to Corsera. There, upon hearing that ten triremes were sailing thither from Dionysius to aid the Lacedaemonians, he first went in person and looked over the ground to find a point from which any who approached the island could be seen and the men stationed there to send signals to the city would be visible, he then stationed his watchers at that point. He also agreed with them as to how they were to signal when the enemy were approaching and when they were at anchor. Then he gave his orders to twenty of the captains whose duty it should be to follow him when the herald gave the word, and in case anyone failed to follow, he warned him that he would not have occasion to find fault with his punishment. Now when the signal came that the triremes were approaching, and when the word was given by the herald, the ardour of all was a sight worth seeing, for there was no one among those who were to sail who did not run to get aboard his ship. 
when Iphicrates had reached the place where the enemy's triremes were, he found the crews of all save one already disembarked on the shore, but Melanippus, the Rhodian, had not only advised the others not to remain there, but had manned his own ship and was sailing out to sea. Now although he met the ships of Iphicrates, he nevertheless escaped, but all the ships from Syracuse were captured, along with their crews. Thereupon Iphicrates cut off the beaks and towed the triremes into the harbour of Corsera, as for the crews, he concluded an agreement that each man should pay a fixed ransom, with the exception of Cronippus the commander, whom he kept under guard, intending either to exact a very large ransom or to sell him. Cronippus, however, was so mortified that he died by a self-inflicted death, and Iphicrates let the rest go, accepting Corsarians as shorties for the ransoms. Now he maintained his sailors for the most part by having them work for the Corsarians on their lands, the Peltastes, however, and the hoplites from his ships he took with him and crossed over to Acarnania. There he gave aid to the cities which were friendly, in case any of them needed aid, and made war upon the Therians, who were very valiant men and were in possession of a very strong fortress. Furthermore, he took over the fleet which was at Corsera, and with almost ninety ships first sailed to Cephalenia and collected money, in some cases with the consent of the people, in other cases against their will. Then he made preparations to inflict damage upon the territory of the Lacedaemonians. And to bring over to his side such of the other hostile states in that region as were willing and to make war upon such as would not yield. Now for my part one not only commend this campaign in particular among all the campaigns of Iphicrates, but I commend, further, his directing the Athenians to choose as his colleagues Callistratus, the popular orator, who was not very favourably inclined toward him, and Chabrias, who was regarded as a very good general. For if he thought them to be able men and hence wished to take them as advisers, he seems to me to have done a wise thing, while on the other hand if he believed them to be his adversaries and wished in so bold a way to prove that he was neither remiss nor neglectful in any point, this seems to me to be the act of a man possessed of great confidence in himself. He, then, was occupied with these things. 3. Meanwhile the Athenians. Seeing that the Plataeans, who were their friends, had been expelled from Boeotia and had fled to them for refuge, and that the Thespians were beseeching them not to allow them to be left without a city, no longer commended to the bands, but, on the contrary, while they were partly ashamed to make war upon them and partly reckoned it to be inexpedient, they nevertheless refused any longer to take part with them in what they were doing, inasmuch as they saw that they were campaigning against the Phocians, who were old friends of the Athenians, and were annihilating cities which had been faithful in the war against the barbarian and were friendly to Athens. For these reasons the Athenian people voted to make peace, and in the first place sent ambassadors to Thebes to invite the, the bands to go with them to Lacedaemon to treat for peace if they so desired, then they sent ambassadors to Lacedaemon themselves. Among those who were chosen were Callias, the son of Hipponicus. Autocles the son of Strambicides, Demostratus, the son of Aristophan, Aristocles, Cephisodotus, Melanopus, and Lycethus. Callistratus, the popular orator, also went with the embassy, for he had promised Iphicrates that if he would let him go home, he would either send money for the fleet or bring about peace, and consequently he had been at Athens and engaged in efforts to secure peace, and when the ambassadors came before the assembly of the Lacedaemonians and the representatives of their allies, the first of them who spoke was Callias, the torchbearer. He was the sort of man to enjoy no less being praised by himself than by others, and on this occasion he began in about the following words, Men of Lacedaemon, as regards the position I hold as your diplomatic agent, I am not the only member of our family who has held it, but my father's father received it from his father and handed it on to his descendants. And I also wish to make clear to you how highly esteemed we have been by our own state. For whenever there is war she chooses us as generals, and whenever she becomes desirous of tranquility she sends us out as peacemakers. I, for example, have twice before now come here to treat for a termination of war, and on both these embassies I succeeded in achieving peace both for you and for ourselves, now for a third time I am come, and it is now, I believe, that with greater justice than ever before I should obtain a reconciliation between us. For I see that you do not think one way and we another, but that you as well as we are distressed over the destruction of Plataea and Thespiae. How, then, is it not fitting that men who hold the same views should be friends of one another rather than enemies? Again, it is certainly the part of wise men not to undertake war even if they should have differences, if they be slight, but if, in fact, we should actually find ourselves in complete agreement, should we not be astounding fools not to make peace? while the Dioscuri, Castor and Paulux, were putative sons of Tyndarius of Sparta. The right course, indeed, would have been for us not to take up arms against one another in the beginning. 
since the tradition is that the first strangers to whom Triptolemus, our ancestor, revealed the mystic rites of Demeter and Kor were Heracles, your state's founder, and the Dioscuri, your citizens, and, further, that it was upon Peloponnesus that he first bestowed the seed of Demeter's fruit. How, then, can it be right, either that you should ever come to destroy the fruit of those very men from whom you received the seed, or that we should not desire those very men, to whom we gave the seed, to obtain the greatest possible abundance of food? But if it is indeed ordered of the gods that wars should come among men, then we ought to begin war as tardily as we can. And, when it has come, to bring it to an end as speedily as possible. After him Autocles, who had the reputation of being a very incisive orator, spoke as follows, men of Lacedaemon, that what I am about to say will not be said to your pleasure, I am not unaware, but it seems to me that men who desire the friendship which they may establish to endure for the longest possible time, ought to point out to one another the causes of their wars. Now you always say, the cities must be independent, but you are yourselves the greatest obstacle in the way of their independence. For the first stipulation you make with your allied cities is this, that they follow wherever you may lead. And yet how is this consistent with independence? And you make for yourselves enemies without taking counsel with your allies, and against those enemies you lead them. So that frequently they who are said to be independent are compelled to take the field against men most friendly to themselves. Furthermore, and there can be nothing in the world more opposed to independence, you establish governments of ten here and governments of thirty there, and in the case of these rulers your care is, not that they shall rule according to law, but that they shall be able to hold possession of their cities by force. So that you manifestly take pleasure in despotisms rather than in free governments. Again, when the king directed that the cities be independent, you showed yourself strongly of the opinion that if the the bands did not allow each one of their cities, not only to rule itself, but also to live under whatever laws it chose, they would not be acting in accordance with the king's writing, but when you had seized the Cadmea, you did not permit even the the bands themselves to be independent. The right thing, however, is that those who are going to be friends should not insist upon obtaining their full rights from others. And then show themselves disposed to grasp the most they can. By these words he caused silence on the part of all, while at the same time he gave pleasure to those who were angry with the Lacedaemonians. After him Callistratus said, Men of Lacedaemon, that mistakes have not been made, both on our side and on yours, I for one do not think I could assert, but I do not hold to the opinion that one ought never again to have any dealings with people who make mistakes. For I see that no one in the world remains always free from error. And it seems to me that through making mistakes men sometimes become even easier to deal with, especially if they have incurred punishment in consequence of their mistakes, as we have. In your own case, also, I see that sometimes many reverses result from the things you have done with too little judgment, among which was, in fact, the seizure of the Cadmea in Thebes, now, at any rate, the cities which you were eager to make independent have all, in consequence of the wrong done to the the bands, fallen again under their power. Hence I hope that now, when we have been taught that to seek selfish advantage is unprofitable, we shall again be reasonable in our friendship with each other. Now touching the slanderous allegations of certain people who wish to defeat the peace, to the effect that we have come here, not because we desire friendship, but rather because we fear that Antalcidas may arrive with money from the king, consider how foolishly they are talking. For the king directed, as you know, that all the cities in Greece were to be independent, why then should we, who agree with the king in both word and deed, be afraid of him? Or does anyone imagine that the king prefers to spend money and make others great, rather than, without expense, to have those things accomplished for him which he judged to be best? So much for that. Why, then, have we come? That it surely is not because we are in straits, you could discover, if you please, by looking at the situation by sea or, if you please, at the situation by land at the present time. What, then, is the reason? manifestly that some of our allies are doing what is not pleasing to us. And perhaps we also should like to show you the gratitude we rightly conceive toward you because you preserved us. Furthermore, to mention also the matter of expediency, there are, of course, among all the cities of Greece, some that take your side and others that take ours, and in each single city some people favour the Lacedaemonians and others the Athenians. If, therefore, we should become friends, from what quarter could we with reason expect any trouble? For who could prove strong enough to vex us by land if you were our friends? And who could do you any harm by sea if we were favourably inclined toward you? Moreover, we all know that wars are forever breaking out and being concluded, and that we, if not now, still at some future time, shall desire peace again. Why, then, 
Should we wait for the time when we shall have become exhausted by a multitude of ills? And not rather conclude peace as quickly as possible before anything irremediable happens? Again, I for my part do not commend those men who, when they have become competitors in the games and have already been victorious many times and enjoy fame, are so fond of contest that they do not stop until they are defeated and so end their athletic training, nor on the other hand do I commend those dicers who, if they win one success, throw for double stakes, for I see that the majority of such people become utterly impoverished. We, then, seeing these things, ought never to engage in a contest of such a sort that we shall either win all or lose all, but ought rather to become friends of one another while we are still strong and successful. For thus we through you, and you through us, could play even a greater part in Greece than in times gone by. Since these men were judged to have spoken rightly, the Lacedaemonians voted to accept the peace. With the provision that all should withdraw their governors from the cities disband their armaments both on sea and on land, and leave the cities independent. And if any state should act in violation of this agreement, it was provided that any which so desired might aid the injured cities, but that any which did not so desire was not under oath to be the ally of those who were injured. On these terms the Lacedaemonians took the oath for themselves and their allies, while the Athenians and their allies took the oath severally, city by city. But the bands also signed their names among the cities which had sworn, but on the following day their ambassadors came in again and demanded that the writing be changed to read that the Boeotians instead of that the bands had sworn. Agesilaus, however, replied that he would change no part of what they had sworn to and signed in the first place, but if they did not wish to be included in the treaty, he said that he would strike out their names if they so directed. When, accordingly, under these circumstances the others had concluded peace while the only controversy was with the the bands. The Athenians were of the opinion that now there was hope that the the bands would be decimated, as the common saying puts it, and as for the the bands themselves, they went home utterly despondent. For, after this the Athenians, on their side, proceeded to withdraw their garrisons from the cities and to send after Iphicrates and his ships, and they compelled him to give back everything which he had captured after the time when the oaths were taken at Lacedaemon. But the Lacedaemonians, on the other hand, while they withdrew both their governors and their garrisons from all the other cities, did not follow this course in the case of Cleombrotus, who was at the head of the army in Phocis and now asked the authorities at home what he should do. Prothus did indeed say that it seemed to him they ought first to disband the army in accordance with their oaths and send round word to the various cities to make contributions, as large as each city chose to make, to the temple of Apollo, and afterwards, in case anyone tried to prevent the cities from being independent, to call together again at that time all who wished to support the cause of independence and lead them against those who opposed it. For he thought. He continued, that in this way the gods would be most favourably inclined toward them and the cities would be least annoyed. The Lacedaemonian assembly, however, upon hearing these words, came to the conclusion that he was talking nonsense, for at this moment, as it seems, fate was leading them on, and they sent orders to Cleombrotus not to disband his army, but to lead it at once against the, the bands if they did not leave the cities independent. When, therefore, he learned that, so far from leaving the cities independent, that the bands were not even disbanding their army, in order that they might marshal themselves against him, under these circumstances he undertook to lead his troops into Boeotia. Now Cleombrotus did not enter Boeotia from Phocis at the point where the, the bands expected him to enter and where they were keeping guard at a narrow pass, but proceeding by way of Thisbe along a mountainous and unexpected route, he arrived at Crucis, captured its wall, and took twelve triremes belonging to the, the bands. After accomplishing this exploit and marching up from the sea coast, he encamped at Leuptra, in the territory of Thespi. And the, the bands encamped on the opposite hill not very far away, with no allies except the Boeotians. Then his friends went to Cleombrotus and said, Cleombrotus, if you let the, the bands escape without a battle, you will be in danger of suffering the uttermost penalty at the hands of your state. For they will remember against you not only the time when you reached Cynocephaly and laid waste no part of the country of the, the bands, but also the time when, on your later expedition, you were beaten back from effecting your end race, although Agesilaus always made his entrance by way of Cytheran. Therefore if you really have a care for yourself or a desire to see your fatherland again, you must lead against these men. Such were the words of his friends. But his opponents said, now is the time when the man will make it clear whether he is in truth partial to the the bands. As rumour has it. Cleombrotus, then, as he heard these things was spurred on to join battle. 
the leaders of the The Bands, on the other hand, calculated that if they did not fight, the city's roundabout would revolt from them and they would themselves be besieged, further, that if the people of Thebes were thus cut off from provisions, the city itself would be in danger of turning against them. And since many of them had been in exile before, they estimated that it was better to die fighting than to be exiled again. Besides this, they were also somewhat encouraged by the oracle which was reported, that the Lacedaemonians were destined to be defeated at the spot where stood the monument of the virgins, who are said to have killed themselves because they had been violated by certain Lacedaemonians. The the bands accordingly decorated this monument before the battle. Furthermore, reports were brought to them from the city that all the temples were opening of themselves. And that the priestesses said that the gods revealed victory. And the messengers reported that from the Heraclium the arms also had disappeared, indicating that Heracles had gone forth to the battle. Some, to be sure, say that all these things were but devices of the leaders. But in the battle, at any rate, everything turned out adversely for the Lacedaemonians, while for the other side everything went prosperously, even to the gifts of fortune. For it was after the morning meal that Cleombrotus held his last council over the battle, and drinking a little, as they did, at the middle of the day, it was said that the wine helped somewhat to excite them. Again, when both sides were arming themselves and it was already evident that there would be a battle, in the first place, after those who had provided the market and some baggage carriers and such as did not wish to fight had set out to withdraw from the Boeotian army, the Lacedaemonian mercenaries under Hiron, the Peltastes of the Phocians, and, among the horsemen, the Heracliots and Flyasians made a circuit and fell upon these people as they were departing. And not only turned them about but chased them back to the camp of the Boeotians. Thereby they made the Boeotian army much larger and more densely massed than it had been before. In the second place, since the space between the armies was a plain, the Lacedaemonians posted their horsemen in front of their phalanx, and the the bands in like manner posted theirs over against them. Now the cavalry of the the bands was in good training as a result of the war with the Orchomenians and the war with the Thespians, while the cavalry of the Lacedaemonians was exceedingly poor at that time. For the richest men kept the horses, and it was only when the ban was called out that the appointed trooper presented himself, then he would get his horse and such arms as were given him, and take the field on the moment's notice. As for the men, on the other hand, it was those who were least strong of body and least ambitious who were mounted on the horses. Such, then, was the cavalry on either side. Coming now to the infantry, it was said that the Lacedaemonians led each half-company three files abreast, and that this resulted in the phalanx being not more than twelve men deep. The the bands, however, were massed not less than fifty shields deep, calculating that if they conquered that part of the army which was around the king, all the rest of it would be easy to overcome. Now when Cleombrotus began to lead his army against the enemy, in the first place, before the troops under him so much as perceived that he was advancing, the horsemen had already joined battle and those of the Lacedaemonians had speedily been worsted, then in their flight they had fallen foul of their own hoplites, and, besides, the companies of the the bands were now charging upon them. Nevertheless, the fact that Cleombrotus and his men were at first victorious in the battle may be known from this clear indication, they would not have been able to take him up and carry him off still living had not those who were fighting in front of him been holding the advantage at that time. But when Danon, the pole march, Sphodrias, one of the king's tent companions, and Cleonymus, the son of Sphodrias, had been killed, then the royal bodyguard, the so-called aides of the pole march, and the others fell back under the pressure of the the band mass, while those who were on the left wing of the Lacedaemonians, when they saw that the right wing was being pushed back, gave way. Yet despite the fact that many had fallen and that they were defeated, after they had crossed the trench which chanced to be in front of their camp they grounded their arms at the spot from which they had set forth. The camp, to be sure, was not on ground which was altogether level, but rather on the slope of a hill. After the disaster some of the Lacedaemonians, thinking it unendurable, said that they ought to prevent the enemy from setting up their trophy and to try to recover the bodies of the dead, not by means of a truce, but by fighting. The Polemarchs, however, seeing that of the whole number of the Lacedaemonians almost a thousand had been killed, seeing, further, that among the Spartiate themselves, of whom there were some seven hundred there, about four hundred had fallen, and perceiving that the allies were one and all without heart for fighting, while some of them were not even displeased at what had taken place, gathered together the most important personages and deliberated about what they should do. And as all thought it best to recover the bodies of the dead by a truce, they finally sent a herald to ask for a truce. After this, then, the the band set up a trophy and gave back the bodies under a truce. 
After these things had happened, the messenger who was sent to carry the news of the calamity to Lacedaemon arrived there on the last day of the festival of the Gymnopedi, when the chorus of men was in the theatre. And when the ephors heard of the disaster, they were indeed distressed, as, I conceive, was inevitable, yet they did not withdraw the chorus, but suffered it to finish its performance. Further, although they duly gave the names of the dead to their several kinsmen, they gave orders to the women not to make any outcry, but to bear the calamity in silence. And on the following day one could see those whose relatives had been killed going about in public with bright and cheerful faces. While of those whose relatives had been reported as living you would have seen but few. And these few walking about gloomy and downcast. After this the ephors called out the ban of the two remaining regiments, going up as far as those who were forty years beyond the minimum military age, they also sent out all up to the same age who belonged to the regiments abroad, for in the original expedition to Phocis only those men who were not more than thirty-five years beyond the minimum age had served, furthermore, they ordered those who at that time had been left behind in public office to join their regiments. Now Agesilaus as a result of his illness was not yet strong, accordingly the state directed Archidamus, his son, to act as commander. And the Tegeans served with him zealously, for the followers of Stasippus were still alive, who were favourable to the Lacedaemonians and had no slight power in their own state. Likewise the Mantineans from their villages supported him stoutly, for they chanced to be under an aristocratic government. Furthermore, the Corinthians, Sicyonians, Phlyasians, and Achaeans followed him with all zeal, and other states also sent out soldiers. Meanwhile the Lacedaemonians themselves and the Corinthians manned triremes and requested the Sicyonians also to help them in so doing, intending to carry the army across the gulf on these ships. And Archidamus accordingly offered his sacrifices at the frontier. As for the the bands, immediately after the battle they sent to Athens a garlanded messenger, and while telling of the greatness of their victory, they at the same time urged the Athenians to come to their aid, saying that now it was possible to take vengeance upon the Lacedaemonians for all the harm they had done to them. Now the senate of the Athenians chanced to be holding it sitting on the Acropolis. And when they heard what had taken place, it was made clear to everyone that they were greatly distressed. For they did not invite the herald to partake of hospitality and about the matter of aid they gave him no answer. So the herald departed from Athens without having received a reply. But to Jason, who was their ally, that the band sent in haste, urging him to come to their aid, for they were debating among themselves how the future would turn out. And Jason immediately proceeded to man triremes, as though he intended to go to their assistance by sea, but in fact he took his mercenary force and his bodyguard of cavalry and, although the Phocians were engaged in a bitter warfare against him, proceeded by land through their country into Boeotia, appearing in many of their towns before it was reported to them that he was on the march. At any rate, before they could gather troops together from here and there, he was already far on ahead, thus making it clear that in many cases it is speed rather than force which accomplishes the desired results. But when he arrived in Boeotia and the the band said that now was the right moment to attack the Lacedaemonians. He with his mercenaries from the heights above and they by a frontal assault. Jason sought to dissuade them, pointing out that since they had done a good work, it was not worthwhile for them to venture a decisive engagement in which they would either accomplish yet greater things or would be deprived of the victory already gained. Do you not see, he said, that in your own case it was when you found yourselves in straits that you won the victory? Therefore one must suppose that the Lacedaemonians also, if they were in like straits, would fight it out regardless of their lives. Besides, it seems that the deity often takes pleasure in making the small great and the great small. With such words, then, he endeavoured to dissuade the the bands from making the final venture, to the Lacedaemonians, on the other hand, he pointed out what manner of thing a defeated army was, and what an army victorious. And if you wish, he said, to forget the disaster which has befallen you, I advise you first to recover your breath and rest yourselves, and then, after you have become stronger, go into battle against men who are unconquered. But now, he said, be well assured that even among your allies there are those who are holding converse with the enemy about a treaty of friendship with them, by all means, then, try to obtain a truce. And I am myself eager for this, he said. Out of a desire to save you, both because of my father's friendship with you and because I am your diplomatic agent. Such, then, were the arguments he urged, but he was acting perhaps with the purpose that these two parties, at variance as they were with one another, might both alike be in need of him. The Lacedaemonians, however, after hearing his words bade him negotiate for the truce, 
and when the report came that the truce had been made, the Polmarks gave orders that after dining all should have their baggage packed and ready with the purpose of setting out during the night, in order that at daybreak they might be climbing Citharan. But when the men had dined and before they went to rest, the Polmarks gave the order to follow, and led the way immediately upon the fall of evening by the road through Crucis, trusting to secrecy more than to the truce. And proceeding with very great difficulty. Since they were withdrawing at night and in fear and by a hard road, they arrived at Egosthena in the territory of Megara. There they fell in with the army under Archidamus. And after waiting there until all the allies had joined him, Archidamus led back the whole army together as far as Corinth, from there he dismissed the allies and led the citizen troops back home. As for Jason, on his way back through Phocis he captured the outer city of the Hyampolitans, laid waste their land, and killed many of them, but he passed through the rest of Phocis without any hostile act. Upon arriving at Heraclea, however, he destroyed the walled city of the Heracleots, manifestly having no fear that when this passageway had been thus thrown open anyone would march against his own dominion, but rather making provision that none should seize Heraclea, situated as it was at a narrow pass, and block his way if he wanted to march to any place in Greece. And when he had come back again to Thessaly, he was in great repute both because he had legally been made Tagus of the Thessalians and because he maintained about him many mercenaries, both foot soldiers and horsemen, these moreover being troops which had been trained to the highest efficiency, his repute was yet greater by reason of his many allies, including, in addition to those whom he already had, also those who were desirous of becoming such. And he was the greatest of the men of his time in that he was not likely to be despised by anyone soever. Now when the Pythian festival was approaching, Jason sent orders to his cities to make ready cattle, sheep, goats, and swine for the sacrifice. And it was said that although he laid upon each city a very moderate demand, there were contributed no fewer than a thousand cattle and more than ten thousand of the other animals. He also made proclamation that a golden crown would be the prize of victory to the city which should rear the finest bull to lead the herd in honor of the god. Furthermore, he gave orders to the Thessalians to make preparations for taking the field at the time of the Pythian festival. For he was intending, it was said, to be himself the director both of the festal assembly in honour of the god and of the games. What he intended, however, in regard to the sacred treasures, is even to this day uncertain, but it is said that when the Delphians asked the god what they should do if he tried to take any of his treasures, Apollo replied that he would himself take care of the matter. At any rate this man, great as he was and purposing deeds so great and of such a kind, after he had held a review and inspection of the cavalry of the Phereans, and was now in his seat and making answer if anyone came to him with any request, was struck down and killed by seven young men who came up to him as though they had some quarrel with one another. And when the guardsmen who attended him rushed stoutly to his aid, one of the young men, while still in the act of striking Jason, was pierced with a lance and killed, a second was caught while mounting his horse suffered many wounds. And so was killed, but the rest leaped upon the horses which they had in readiness and escaped, and in most of the Greek cities to which they came they were honoured. This fact, indeed, made it plain that the Greeks had conceived a very great fear lest Jason should become tyrant. When he had thus been slain, Polydorus, his brother, and Polyphron succeeded to the office of Tagus. Now Polydorus, while the two were on their way to Larissa, was killed at night in his sleep by Polyphron, his brother, as people thought, for his death was sudden and without manifest cause. Then Polyphron, in his turn, held sway for a year, and made the office of Tagus like the rule of a tyrant. For in Pharsalus he put to death Polydamas and ate more of the best among the citizens, and from Larissa he drove many into exile. While thus engaged he, also, was slain by Alexander, who posed as avenger of Polydorus and destroyer of the tyranny. But when Alexander had himself succeeded to the position of ruler, he proved a cruel Tagus to the Thessalians, a cruel enemy to the Thebans and Athenians, and an unjust robber both by land and by sea. Being such a man, he likewise was slain in his turn, the actual deed being done by his wife's brothers, though the plan was conceived by the woman herself. For she reported to her brothers that Alexander was plotting against them, and concealed them within the house for the entire day. Then after she had received Alexander home in a drunken state and had put him to bed, while the light was left burning she carried his sword out of the chamber. And when she perceived that her brothers were hesitating to go in and attack Alexander, she said that if they did not act at once she would wake him. Then, as soon as they had gone in, she closed the door and held fast to the knocker until her husband had been killed. Now her hatred toward her husband is said by some people to have been caused by the fact that when Alexander had imprisoned his own favourite, 
who was a beautiful youth, and she begged him to release him, he took him out and slew him, others, however, say that Inasmuch as no children were being born to him of this woman, Alexander was sending to Thebes and trying to win as his wife the widow of Jason. The reasons, then, for the plot on the part of his wife are thus stated, but as for those who executed this deed, Tisiphonus, who was the eldest of the brothers, held the position of ruler up to the time when this narrative was written. 5. All the events, then, which took place in Thessaly in connection with Jason, and, after his death, down to the rule of Tisiphonus. Have thus been described, now I return to the point from which I digress to discuss these matters. When, namely, Archidamus had led back his army from the relief expedition to Leuctra, the Athenians, taking thought of the fact that the Peloponnesians still counted themselves bound to follow the Lacedaemonians, and that the latter were not yet in the same situation to which they had brought the Athenians, invited to Athens all the cities which wished to participate in the peace which the king had sent down. And when they had come together, they passed a resolution to take the following oath, in company with such as desired to share in the peace, I will abide by the treaty which the king sent down, and by the decrees of the Athenians and their allies. And if anybody takes the field against any one of the cities which have sworn this oath, I will come to her aid with all my strength. Now all the others were pleased with the oath, the Aleans only opposed it. Saying that it was not right to make either the Marganians. Saluncians, or Triphilians independent, for these cities were theirs. But the Athenians and the others, after voting that both small and great cities alike should be independent, even as the king wrote, sent out the officers charged with administering the oath and directed them to administer it to the highest authorities in each city. And all took the oath except the Aleans. As a natural result of these proceedings the Mantineans, feeling that they were now entirely independent, all came together and voted to make Mantinea a single city and to put a wall about it. But the Lacedaemonians, on the other hand, thought that it would be a grievous thing if this were done without their approval. They accordingly sent to Gesilors as ambassador to the Mantineans, because he was regarded as an ancestral friend of theirs. Now when he had come to them, the officials refused to assemble for him the Mantinean people, but bade him tell them what he desired. He then offered them his promise that, if they would desist from their wall building for the present, he would arrange matters so that the wall should be constructed with the approval of Lacedaemon and without great expense. And when they replied that it was impossible to desist, since a resolution to build at once had been adopted by the entire city, Agesilors thereupon departed in anger. It did not seem to be possible, however, to make an expedition against them, inasmuch as the peace had been concluded on the basis of independence. Meanwhile some of the Arcadian cities sent men to help the Mantineans in their building, and the Aleans made them a contribution of three talents in money toward the expense of the war. The Mantineans, then, were occupied with this work. Among the Tegeans, on the other hand, the followers of Calibius and Proxenus were making efforts to the end that all the people of Arcadia should unite. And that whatever measure was carried in the common assembly should be binding on the several cities as well. But the followers of Stasippus made it their policy to leave their city undisturbed and to live under the laws of their fathers. Now the followers of Proxenus and Calibius, defeated in the council of the magistrates, and conceiving the thought that if the people came together they would prove far superior in numbers, gathered openly under arms. Upon seeing this the followers of Stasippus also armed themselves in their turn, and they did indeed prove fewer in number, when, however, they had set forth for battle, they killed Proxenus and a few others along with him, but although they put the rest to flight they did not pursue them, for Stasippus was the sort of man not to desire to kill many of his fellow citizens. Then the followers of Calibius, who had retired to a position under the city wall and the gates on the side toward Mantinea, inasmuch as their adversaries were no longer attacking them, remained quietly gathered there. They had long before this sent to the Mantineans bidding them come to their aid. But with the followers of Stasippus they were negotiating for a reconciliation. When, however, the Mantineans were to be seen approaching, some of them leaped upon the wall, urged the Mantineans to come on to their assistance with all possible speed, and with shouts exhorted them to hurry, others meanwhile opened the gates to them. Now when the followers of Stasippus perceived what was going on, they rushed out by the gates leading to Palantium, gained refuge in the temple of Artemis before they could be overtaken by their pursuers, and after shutting themselves in, remained quiet there. But their foes who had followed after them climbed upon the temple, broke through the roof, and pelted them with the tiles. And when the people within realized the hopelessness of their situation, they bade them stop and said they would come out. Then their adversaries, as soon as they had got them in their power, bound them, threw them into a wagon, and carried them back to Tegea. There, in company with the Mantineans, they passed sentence upon them and put them to death. 
while these things were going on, about 800 of the Tegeans who were partisans of Stasippus fled to Lacedaemon as exiles, and subsequently the Lacedaemonians decided that, in accordance with their oaths, they ought to avenge the Tegeans who had been slain and to aid those who had been banished. So they decided to make an expedition against the Mantineans on the ground that, in violation of their oaths, they had proceeded in arms against the Tegeans. The ephors accordingly called out the ban, and the state directed Agesilaus to act as commander. Now most of the Arcadians were gathering together at Asia. But since the Orchomenians refused to be members of the Arcadian League on account of their enmity toward the Mantineans, and had even received into their city the mercenary force, commanded by Polytropus, which had been collected at Corinth. The Mantineans were remaining at home and keeping watch upon them. On the other hand, the Hurrians and Leprians were serving with the Lacedaemonians against the Mantineans. Agesilaus, then, when his sacrifices at the frontier proved favourable, at once proceeded to march against Arcadia. And having occupied Utea, which was a city on the border, and found there the older men, the women, and the children living in their houses, while the men of military age had gone to the Arcadian assembly, he nevertheless did the city no harm, but allowed the people to continue to dwell there, and his troops got everything that they needed by purchase, and if anything had been taken as booty at the time when he entered the city, he searched it out and gave it back. He also occupied himself, during the whole time that he spent there awaiting the mercenaries under Polytropus, in repairing all those portions of the city wall which needed it. Meanwhile the Mantineans made an expedition against the Orchomenians. And they came off very badly from their attack upon the city wall. And some of them were killed, but when in their retreat they had reached Elymia and, although the Orchomenian hoplites now desisted from following them. Polytropus and his troops were very boldly pressing upon them, then the Mantineans, realizing that if they did not beat them off many of their own number would be struck down by javelins, turned about and charged their assailants. Polytropus fell fighting where he stood, the rest fled, and very many of them would have been killed had not the Flyasian horsemen arrived, and by riding around to the rear of the Mantineans made them desist from their pursuit. The Mantineans, then, after accomplishing these things, went back home. Agesilaus heard of this affair and came to the conclusion that the mercenaries from Orchomenus could not now join him, under these circumstances, therefore, he continued his advance. On the first day he took dinner in the territory of Tegea, and on the following day crossed into the territory of the Mantineans and encamped at the foot of the mountains to the west of Mantinea. There at the same time he laid waste the land and plundered the farms. Meanwhile the Arcadians who had assembled at Asia made their way by night to Tegea. On the next day Agesilaus encamped at a distance of about twenty stadia from Mantinea. But the Arcadians from Tegea, a very large force of hoplites, made their appearance, they were skirting the mountains between Mantinea and Tegea, desiring to effect a junction with the Mantineans, for the Argives, who came with them, were not in full force. And there were some who tried to persuade Agesilaus to attack these troops separately, he, however, fearing that while he was marching against them the Mantineans might issue forth from their city and attack him in flank and rear, judged it best to allow the two hostile forces to come together and, in case they wished to fight, to conduct the battle in regular fashion and in the open. The Arcadians from Tegea had by now effected a junction with the Mantineans. On the other hand, the Peltastes from Orchomenus. And with them the horsemen of the Flyasians made their way during the night past Mantinea and appeared as Agesilaus was sacrificing in front of his camp at daybreak, and they caused the Lacedaemonians to fall hurriedly into line and Agesilaus himself to retire to the camp. But when they had been recognized as friends, and Agesilaus had obtained favorable omens, immediately after breakfast he led his army forward. Later, as evening was coming on, he unwittingly encamped in the valley which lies behind the town of Mantinea, it is surrounded by mountains which are only a short distance away. On the following day at daybreak he was offering sacrifices in front of the army, and seeing that troops were gathering from the city of the Mantineans on the mountains which were above the rear of his army, he decided that he must lead his men out of the valley with all possible speed. Now he feared that if he led the way himself, the enemy would fall upon his rear, accordingly. While keeping quiet and presenting his front toward the enemy. He ordered the men at the rear to face about to the right and march along behind the phalanx toward him and in this manner he was at the same time leading them out of the narrow valley and making the phalanx continually stronger. When the phalanx had thus been doubled in depth, he proceeded into the plain with the hoplites in this formation, and then extended the army again into a line nine or ten shields deep. The Mantineans, however, now desisted from coming forth from their city, for the Alenes, 
who were making the campaign with them, urged them not to fight a battle until the the bands arrived, and they said they were quite sure that the the bands would come, for they had borrowed ten talents from the Aleans themselves for the expenses of the expedition to aid them. The Arcadians, then, upon hearing this, remained quiet in Mantinea, and Agesilaus. Even though he was exceedingly desirous of leading back his army, for it was midwinter, nevertheless remained there for three days. Not far away from the city of the Mantineans, that he might not be thought to be hurrying his departure out of fear. On the fourth day, however, after breakfasting early he began his homeward march, intending to encamp at the place where he had originally made camp on his departure from Utea. But since none of the Arcadians appeared, he continued his march as rapidly as possible to Utea, even though it was very late, with the desire of getting his hoplites away before they even saw the enemy's fires, so that no one could say that he had withdrawn in flight. For he seemed to have brought the state some relief from its former despondency, inasmuch as he had invaded Arcadia and, though he laid waste the land, none had been willing to fight with him. And after he had arrived in Laconia, he let the Spartiati go home and dismissed the Perioesi to their several cities. As for the Arcadians, since Agesilaus had departed and they learned that his army had been disbanded, while they themselves were still gathered together, they made an expedition against the Hurrians, not only because they refused to be members of the Arcadian League, but also because they had joined with the Lacedaemonians in invading Arcadia. And after entering the territory of Heria, they proceeded to burn the houses and cut down the trees. It was not until the the bands with their supporting force were reported to have arrived in Mantinea that the Arcadians departed from Heria and united with the the bands. When they had joined forces, the the bands thought that matters stood well with them, inasmuch as they had come to bring aid and there was no longer an enemy to be seen in the land, they accordingly made their preparations for going back. But the Arcadians, Argives, and Aleans urged them to lead the way with all speed into Laconia, pointing out the number of their own troops and praising beyond measure the army of the the bands. For all the Boeotians were now training themselves in the craft of arms, glorying in their victory at Leuctra, and they were reinforced by the Phocians, who had become their subjects, the Eubians from all their cities, both the Locrian peoples, the Acarnanians, the Heracleots, and the Malians, they were also reinforced by horsemen and peltastes from Thessaly. The Arcadians, then, seeing all this and describing the dearth of men in Lacedaemon, begged them by no means to turn back before invading the country of the Lacedaemonians. But while the the bands listened to this request, they took into account, on the other hand, the fact that Laconia was said to be exceedingly difficult to enter, and that they believed garrisons were posted at the points of easiest access. For Iskalaus was at Oium, in Siritis, commanding a garrison composed of emancipated helots and about four hundred of the youngest of the Tegean exiles, and there was another garrison also at Leuctrum, above Maliatis. The the bands likewise weighed this consideration that the force of the Lacedaemonians would gather quickly and that they would fight nowhere better than in their own country. Therefore, taking into account all these things, they were by no means eager to proceed into Lacedaemon. But when people had come from Carii telling of the dearth of men, promising that they would themselves act as guides, and bidding that the band slay them if they were found to be practicing any deception, and when. Further, some of the Perioesi appeared, asking the the bands to come to their aid, engaging to revolt if only they would show themselves in the land, and saying also that even now the Perioesi when summoned by the Spartiati were refusing to go and help them, as a result, then, of hearing all these reports, in which all agreed, that the bands were won over, and pushed in with their own forces by way of Carii, while the Arcadians went by way of Oium, in Siritis. Now if Iskalaus had advanced to the difficult part of the pass and had made his stand there, no one, by all accounts, could have accomplished the ascent by that route at least, but in fact, since he wished to employ the Owens as allies, he remained in the village, and the Arcadians ascended the pass in very great numbers. There, in the face-to-face -face fighting, the troops with Iskalaus were victorious, but when the enemy showered blows and missiles upon them from the rear, on the flank, and from the houses upon which they mounted, then Iskalaus was killed and all the rest as well, unless one or another slipped through unrecognized. After achieving this deed the Arcadians marched to join the the bands at Carii, and when the the bands heard what had been accomplished by the Arcadians, they proceeded to make the descent with far greater boldness. Coming to Celasia, they at once burned and pillaged it, but when they arrived in the plain, they encamped there, in the sacred precinct of Apollo. The next day they marched on. Now they did not even make the attempt to cross over by the bridge against Sparta. For in the sanctuary of Athena Aelia the hoplites were to be seen, ready to oppose them, but keeping the Eurotas on their right they pass along, burning and plundering houses full of many valuable things. 
As for the people in the city, the women could not even endure the sight of the smoke, since they had never seen an enemy, but the Spartati, their city being without walls, were posted at intervals, one here, another there, and so kept guard, thought they were, and were seen to be, very few in number. It was also determined by the authorities to make proclamation to the helots that if any wished to take up arms and be assigned to a place in the ranks, they should be given a promise that all should be free who took part in the war. And it was said that at first more than six thousand enrolled themselves, so that they in their turn occasioned fear when they were marshalled together, and were thought to be all too numerous. But when the mercenaries from Orcomenus remained true, and the Lacedaemonians received aid from the Flyasians, Corinthians, Epidorians, Polenians, and likewise some of the other states, then the Spartati were less fearful of those who had been enrolled. Now when, in its onward march, the army of the enemy came opposite Amicli, at this point they crossed the Eurotas. And wherever the, the bands encamped they at once threw down in front of their lines the greatest possible quantity of the trees which they cut down, and in this way guarded themselves, the Arcadians, however, did nothing of this sort, but left their camp behind them and turned their attention to plundering the houses. After this, on the third or fourth day of the invasion, the horsemen advanced to the racecourse in the sanctuary of Poseidon Gieotus by divisions, the, the bands in full force, the Aelines, and all the horsemen who were there of the Phocians, the Salians, or Locrians. And the horsemen of the Lacedaemonians, seemingly very few in number, were formed in line against them. Meanwhile, the Lacedaemonians had set an ambush of the younger hoplites, about three hundred in number, in the house of the Tindaridae, and at the same moment these men rushed forth and their horsemen charged. The enemy, however, did not await their attack, but gave way. And on seeing this, many of the foot soldiers also took to flight. But when the pursuers stopped and the army of the, the band stood firm, the enemy encamped again. It now seemed somewhat more certain that they would make no further attempt upon the city, and in fact their army departed thence and took the road toward Halos and Jethium. And they burned such of the towns as were unwalled and made a three days attack upon Jethium, where the Lacedaemonians had their dockyards. There were some of the Perioesi also who not only joined in this attack, but did regular service with the troops that followed the, the bands. When the Athenians heard of all these things, they were in a state of concern as to what they should do in regard to the Lacedaemonians. And by resolution of the Senate they called a meeting of the assembly. Now it chanced that there were present ambassadors of the Lacedaemonians and of the allies who still remained to them. Wherefore the Lacedaemonians spoke, Arrakis, Asilus, Pharax, Etymocles, and Olanthius, almost all of them saying much the same things. They reminded the Athenians that from all time the two peoples had stood by one another in the most important crises for good ends, for they on their side, they said, had aided in expelling the tyrants from Athens, while the Athenians, on the other hand, gave them zealous assistance at the time when they were hard pressed by the Messenians. They also described all the blessings which were enjoyed at the time when both peoples were acting in union, recalling how they had together driven the barbarian back, recalling likewise how the Athenians had been chosen by the Greeks as leaders of the fleet and custodians of the common funds. The Lacedaemonians supporting this choice. While they had themselves been selected by the common consent of all the Greeks as leaders by land, the Athenians in their turn supporting this selection. And one of them even said something like this, but if you and we, gentlemen, come to agreement, there is hope now that the, the bands will be decimated, as the old saying has it. The Athenians, however, were not very much inclined to accept all this, and a murmur went round to the effect that this is what they say now, but in the time when they were prosperous they were hostile to us. The weightiest of the arguments urged by the Lacedaemonians seemed to their hearers to be, that at the time when they subdued the Athenians, though the bands wanted to destroy Athens utterly, it was they who had prevented it. Most stress was laid, however, upon the consideration that the Athenians were required by their oaths to come to their assistance, for it was not because the Lacedaemonians had done wrong that the Arcadians and those with them were making an expedition against them, but rather because they had gone to the aid of the Tegeans for the reason that the Mantineans, in violation of their oaths, had taken the field against them. At these words an uproar again ran through the assembly, for some said that the Mantineans had done right in avenging the followers of Proxenus who had been slain by the followers of Stasippus, while others said that they were in the wrong because they had taken up arms against the Tegeans. While the assembly itself was trying to determine these matters, Clytals, a Corinthian, arose and spoke as follows, Men of Athens, it is perhaps a disputed point who began the wrongdoing, but as for us, can anyone accuse us of having at any time since peace was concluded? either made a campaign against any city, or taken anyone's property, or laid waste another's land. 
yet, nevertheless, that the bands have come into our country, and have cut down trees, and burned down houses, and seized property and cattle. If, therefore, you do not aid us, who are so manifestly wronged, will you not surely be acting in violation of your oaths? They were the same oaths, you remember, that you yourselves took care to have all of us swear to all of you. Thereupon the Athenians shouted their approval, saying that Clytals had spoken to the point and fairly. Then Procles, a Flyasian, arose after Clytals and said, Men of Athens, it is clear to everyone, I imagine, that you are the first against whom the bands would march if the Lacedaemonians were got out of the way, for they think that you are the only people in Greece who would stand in the way of their becoming rulers of the Greeks. If this is so, I, for my part, believe that if you undertake a campaign, you would not be giving aid to the Lacedaemonians so much as to your own selves. For to have the the bands, who are unfriendly to you and dwell on your borders, become leaders of the Greeks, would prove much more grievous to you, I think, than when you had your antagonists far away. Furthermore, you would aid yourselves with more profit if you should do so while there are still people who would fight on your side, than if they should perish first and you should then be compelled to enter by yourselves upon a decisive struggle with the the bands. Now if any are fearful that in case the Lacedaemonians escape this time, they may again in the future cause you trouble, take thought of this, that it is not those whom one benefits, but those whom one injures, of whom one has to fear that they may some day attain great power. And you should bear in mind this likewise. That it is meet both for individuals and for states to acquire a goodly store in the days when they are strongest. In order that, if some day they become powerless, they may draw upon their previous labours for succour. So to you has now been offered by some god an opportunity, in case you aid the Lacedaemonians in their need, of acquiring them for all time as friends who will plead no excuses. For it is not in the presence of only a few witnesses, as it seems to me, that they would now receive benefit at your hands, but the gods will know of this, who see all things both now and forever, and both your allies and your enemies know also what is taking place, and the whole world of Greeks and barbarians besides. For to none of them all is it a matter of indifference. Therefore, if the Lacedaemonians should show themselves base in their dealings with you, who would ever again become devoted to them? But it is fair to expect that they will prove good rather than base men. For if any people in the world seem consistently to have striven for commendation and to have abstained from deeds of shame, it is truly they. Besides all this, take thought of the following considerations likewise. If ever again danger should come to Greece from barbarians, whom would you trust more than the Lacedaemonians? Whom would you more gladly make your comrades in the ranks than these, whose countrymen, posted at Thermopylae, chose every man to die fighting rather than to live and admit the barbarian to Greece? Therefore, both because they proved themselves brave men along with you, and because there is hope that they will so prove themselves again, is it not surely right that you and we alike should show all goodwill toward them? It is also worthwhile to show the Lacedaemonians goodwill for the sake of the allies who are present with them. For be well assured that those who remain faithful to them in their misfortunes are the very men who would be ashamed if they did not make due requital to you. And if we who are willing to share the peril with them seem to be small states. Reflect that if your state is added to our number. We who aid them shall no longer be small states. In former days, men of Athens, I used from hearsay to admire this state of yours, for I heard that all who were wronged and all who were fearful fled hither for refuge, and here found assistance, now I no longer hear, but with my own eyes at this moment see the Lacedaemonians, those most famous men, and their most loyal friends appearing in your state and in their turn requesting you to assist them. I see also that the bands, who then did not succeed in persuading the Lacedaemonians to enslave you, now requesting you to allow those who saved you to perish. It is truly a noble deed that is told of your ancestors, when they did not suffer those Argives who died at the Cadmea to go unburied, but you would achieve a far nobler deed if you did not suffer those Lacedaemonians who still live either to incur insult or to perish. And while that other deed was also noble, when you checked the insolence of Eurystheus and preserved the sons of Heracles, would it not surely be an even nobler one if you saved from perishing, not merely the founders, but the whole state as well? And noblest of all deeds if, after the Lacedaemonians saved you then by a vote, void of danger, you shall aid them now with arms and at the risk of your lives. Again, when even we, who by word urge you to aid brave men, are proud of doing so, it would manifestly be generous of you, who are able to aid by act, if, after being many times both friends and enemies of the Lacedaemonians, you should recall, not the harm you have suffered at their hands, but rather the favours which you have, received, and should render them requital, not in behalf of yourselves alone, but also in behalf of all Greece, because in her behalf they proved themselves brave men.
After this the Athenians deliberated, and they would not endure to listen to those who spoke on the other side, but voted to go to the aid of the Lacedaemonians in full force, and chose Iphicrates as general. And when his sacrifices had proved favourable and he had issued orders to his men to dine in the academy, many, it is said, went thither ahead of Iphicrates himself. After this Iphicrates led the way and they followed, believing that he would lead them to some noble achievement. And when, after arriving in Corinth, he delayed there for some days, they at once began to censure him, for the first time, for this delay, then when he at length marched them forth, they eagerly followed wherever he led the way, and eagerly attacked any stronghold against which he brought them. As for the enemy in Lacedaemon, many Arcadians, Argives, and Alenes had already departed, in Asmach as they lived just across the border, some of them leading and others carrying what they had taken as plunder. On the other hand, that the bands and the rest were desirous of departing from the country, partly for the very reason that they saw their army growing daily smaller, and partly because provisions were scantier, the supply having been in part used up or stolen away, in part wasted or burned up. Besides, it was winter, so that by this time all alike wanted to withdraw. When, accordingly, they proceeded to retire from Lacedaemon, then, of course, Iphicrates likewise proceeded to lead back the Athenians from Arcadia to Corinth. Now I have no fault to find with any good generalship he may have shown on any other occasion, but as regards all his actions at that time, I find them to have been either futile or inexpedient. For while he undertook to keep guard at Onium so that the band should not be able to get back home, he left unguarded the best pass, which led past sentry. And when he wanted to find out whether the bands had passed Onium, he sent as scouts all the horsemen both of the Athenians and of the Corinthians. And yet a few men would have been quite as efficient for seeing as the many, while if it were necessary to retire, it would be much easier for the few than for the many both to find an easy route and to retire at their leisure. But to employ a force that was numerous and still inferior to the enemy, was this not surely the height of folly? For in Asmach as the horsemen extended their line over a large space because they were a large force. When it was necessary to retire they encountered a large number of difficult places, so that no fewer than twenty horsemen lost their lives. At that time, then, that the bands returned home as they pleased. Book 7. 1. In the following year ambassadors of the Lacedaemonians and their allies with full powers, came to Athens to take counsel as to what should be the terms of the alliance between the Lacedaemonians and the Athenians. And while many foreigners and many Athenians said that the alliance ought to be on terms of full equality, Procles the Flyasian made the following speech, Men of Athens, since you have decided that it is a good thing to make the Lacedaemonians your friends, it seems to me that you ought to consider this point, how the friendship is to endure for the longest possible time. Now it is only by making the compact on such terms as will be most advantageous to each party that we can expect it to be, in all probability, most enduring. The other points, then, have been pretty well agreed upon, but the question of the leadership is at present under discussion. Now it has been proposed by your Senate that the leadership by sea shall belong to you, and the leadership by land to the Lacedaemonians. And I, too, think that this distinction is based not so much upon human judgment as upon divine arrangement and ordering. In the first place, you have a position most excellently adapted by nature for supremacy by sea. For most of the states which are dependent upon the sea are situated round about your state, and they are all weaker than yours. In addition to this, you have harbours, without which it is not possible to enjoy naval power. Furthermore, you already possess many triremes, and it is a traditional policy of yours to keep adding ships. You likewise possess as peculiarly your own all the arts and crafts which have to do with ships. Again, you are far superior to other men in experience of nautical affairs, for most of you get your livelihood from the sea, hence, while attending to your private concerns, you are also at the same time gaining experience for encounters by sea. Here is another point also, there is no port from which more triremes can sail forth at one time than from your city. And this is a matter of no slight importance with reference to leadership. For all men love best to join forces with the power which is first to show itself strong. Furthermore, it has also been granted you by the gods to be successful in this pursuit. For while you have engaged in very many and very great combats by sea, you have met with an exceedingly small number of misfortunes and have achieved an exceedingly large number of successes. Therefore it is likely that the allies would like best to share in such perils if they were under your leadership and that this devotion to the sea is indeed both necessary and proper for you, you must conclude from the following fact, the Lacedaemonians once made war upon you for many years, and though masters of your land could make no progress toward destroying you. 
but when at length the deity granted them to win the mastery by sea, straightway you fell completely under their power. In these circumstances, therefore, it is plain to be seen that all your safety depends upon the sea. Such, then, being the situation ordained by nature. How could you be content to allow the Lacedaemonians to be leaders by sea, when, in the first place, they themselves admit that they are less experienced than you are in this work, and when, in the second place, they do not risk as much as you do in contests by sea, but merely the people on board the triremes, whereas you risk wives and children and the entire state? This is the situation on your side, consider now that of the Lacedaemonians. Firstly, they dwell in the interior, hence, so long as they are masters of the land, they can lead a comfortable existence even if they are shut off from the sea. Therefore, realizing this fact themselves, they carry on their training from their very boyhood with a view to war by land. Furthermore, in that which is of the greatest importance, obedience to their commanders, they are best by land, as you are by sea. Again, they on their side can set forth by land, as you can with a fleet. In greatest numbers and with greatest speed. Therefore it is to them in turn that the armies of the allies would be likely to attach themselves with greatest confidence. Besides, the deity has granted, as to you success by sea, so to them success by land, for while they on their side have engaged in very many combats on the land, they have incurred an exceedingly small number of defeats, and have won an exceedingly large number of victories. And that this devotion to the land is no less necessary for them than devotion to the sea for you, one may judge from the results. For you made war upon them for many years, and though you defeated them many times by sea, could make no progress toward subduing them. But so soon as they incurred one defeat on the land, immediately their wives and children and their entire state were at stake. Hence for them, on their side, it would surely be a dreadful thing to allow others to be leaders by land, when they themselves are best at the administration of affairs by land. As for myself, therefore, the course which has been proposed by your senate is that which I have urged and which I believe to be most advantageous to both parties. And may you, for your part, be fortunate in reaching the conclusion that is best for us all. Thus he spoke, and both the Athenians and those Lacedaemonians who were present applauded his speech vigorously. But Cephisodotus came forward and said, Men of Athens, you do not observe that you are being deceived, but if you will listen to me, I will prove it to you very speedily. As the matter now stands, you are to be leaders by sea. And if the Lacedaemonians are your allies, it is clear that the captains, and perhaps the marines whom they send out, will be Lacedaemonians, but it is also clear that the sailors will be either helots or mercenaries. You, therefore, will be leaders of these people. When, however, the Lacedaemonians give you the order for a campaign by land, it is clear that you will send your hoplites and your horsemen. By this plan, therefore, they become leaders of your own selves. While you become leaders merely of their slaves and their men of least account. Answer me, he said, Timocrates of Lacedaemon, did you not say a moment ago that you had come with intent to make the alliance on terms of full equality? I did say that. Then, said Cephisodotus, is there anything more equal than that each party in turn should be leader of the fleet, and each in turn leader of the army, and that you, if there is any advantage in the leadership by sea, should share therein, and we likewise in the matter of leadership by land? Upon hearing this the Athenians were led to change their minds, and they voted that each party should hold the leadership in turn for periods of five days. Now when both peoples and their allies had proceeded to Corinth, it was determined that they should together guard Onium. Accordingly, while the the bands and their allies were on the march, they formed their lines and proceeded to keep guard at one point and another of Onium, but the Lacedaemonians and the Pelenians at the most assailable point. And the the bands and their allies when they were distant thirty stadia from the troops on guard, encamped in the plain. Then, after calculating the time at which they thought they should start in order to finish their journey at dawn, they marched upon the garrison of the Lacedaemonians. And in fact they did not prove mistaken in the hour, but fell upon the Lacedaemonians and the Pelenians at the time when the night watches were just coming to an end, and the men were rising from their camp beds and going wherever each one had to go. Thereupon the the bands made their attack and laid on their blows, men prepared attacking those unprepared, and men in good order against those in disorder. And when such as came out of the affair with their lives had made their escape to the nearest hill. Although the pole march of the Lacedaemonians might have got as many hoplites and as many peltastes as he pleased from the forces of the allies and might have held his position, for supplies might have been brought in safety from sentry, he did not do this. 
but while the, the bands were in great perplexity as to how they were to descend on the side looking towards Sikion, failing which they would have to go back again, he concluded a truce which, as most people thought, was more to the advantage of the, the bands than to that of his own side, and under these circumstances departed and led away the troops under his command. The, the bands, then, after descending in safety and effecting a junction with their allies, the Arcadians, Argives, and Alenes, immediately attacked Sicyon and Pelene, they also made an expedition to Epidaurus, and laid waste the whole territory of the Epidaurians. Returning from there in a manner which showed great disdain for all their adversaries, as soon as they came near the city of the Corinthians they rushed at the double toward the gates through which one passes in going to Flyus, with the intention of bursting in if they chanced to be open. But some light troops sallied forth from the city against them and met the picked men of the, the bands at a distance of not so much as four plethora from the city walls. Then they climbed up on burial monuments and elevated spots, killed a very considerable number of the troops in the front ranks by hurling javelins and other missiles, and after putting the rest to flight, pursued them about three or four stadia. When this had taken place, the Corinthians dragged the bodies to the wall, and after they had given them back under a truce, set up a trophy. In this way the allies of the Lacedaemonians were renewed in their spirits. Just after these events had happened, the expedition sent by Dionysius to aid the Lacedaemonians sailed in, numbering more than twenty triremes. And they brought Celts, Iberians, and about fifty horsemen. On the following day the, the bands and the rest, their allies, after forming themselves in detached bodies and filling the plain as far as the sea and as far as the hills adjoining the city, destroyed whatever of value there was in the plain. And the horsemen of the Athenians and of the Corinthians did not approach very near their army, seeing that the enemy were strong and numerous. But the horsemen sent by Dionysius, few though they were, scattering themselves here and there, would ride along the enemy's line, charge upon them and throw javelins at them, and when the enemy began to move forth against them, would retreat, and then turn round and throw their javelins again. And while pursuing these tactics they would dismount from their horses and rest. But if anyone charged upon them while they were dismounted, they would leap easily upon their horses and retreat. On the other hand, if any pursued them far from the, the Ban army, they would press upon these men when they were retiring, and by throwing javelins work havoc with them, and thus they compelled the entire army, according to their own will, either to advance or to fall back. After this, however, the, the bands remained but a few days and then returned home, and the others likewise to their several homes. Then the troops sent by Dionysius invaded the territory of Sicyon, and they not only defeated the Sicyonians in battle on the plain and killed about seventy of them, but captured by storm the stronghold of Des. After these exploits the first supporting force sent out by Dionysius sailed back to Syracuse. Up to this time the, the bands and all who had revolted from the Lacedaemonians had been acting and carrying on their campaigns in full accord, under the leadership of the, the bands. Now, however, there appeared a certain Lycomedes of Mantinea, a man inferior to none in birth, foremost in wealth, and ambitious besides, and filled the Arcadians with self-confidence, saying that it was to them alone that Peloponnesus was a fatherland, since they were the only autochthonous stock that dwelt therein, and that the Arcadian people was the most numerous of all the Greek peoples and had the strongest bodies. He also declared that they were the bravest, offering as evidence the fact that whenever men needed mercenaries, there were none whom they chose in preference to Arcadians. Furthermore, the Lacedaemonians had never, he said, invaded the territory of Athens without their help, nor had the, the bands at present come to Lacedaemon without the help of the Arcadians. If you are wise, therefore, you will leave off following wherever anyone summons you, for in former days, by following the Lacedaemonians, you made them great, and now, if you follow the, the bands heedlessly and do not make the claim to enjoy the leadership by turns with them, it may be that you will soon find in them another set of Lacedaemonians. Upon hearing these words the Arcadians were puffed up, and loved Lycomedes beyond measure, and thought that he alone was a man, so that they appointed as their leaders whomsoever he directed them to appoint. But the Arcadians were exalted as a result also of the actual achievements which fell to their lot. For when the Argives had invaded the country of Epidaurus and their way out had been barred by the mercenaries under Chabrias, and by the Athenians and the Corinthians, they went to the rescue and released the Argives from an absolute blockade, although they had not only the enemy's troops but also the character of the country to contend with. They also made an expedition to a scene in Laconia, defeated the garrison of the Lacedaemonians, slew Gerenor, the Spartiate who had become Pole March, and plundered the outer city of the Asinians. And whenever they wished to take the field, neither night nor storm nor length of journey nor difficult mountains would prevent them, so that at that time they counted themselves altogether the strongest of the Greeks.
for these reasons that the bands naturally felt somewhat jealous and no longer friendly toward the Arcadians. As for the Aleans, when they demanded back again from the Arcadians the cities of which they had been deprived by the Lacedaemonians and found that the Arcadians gave no heed to Philians and the others who had revolted from them. Because these people said they were Arcadians. As a result of this the Aleans in their turn felt unfriendly toward them. While the several allies were each thus filled with proud confidence in themselves, Philiscus of Abydus came from Ariobarzanes with a large amount of money. And in the first place he brought together at Delphi the bands, their allies, and the Lacedaemonians to negotiate in regard to peace. But when they had arrived there, they did not consult the god at all as to how peace should be brought about, but deliberated for themselves. Since, however, that the bands would not agree that Messene should be subject to the Lacedaemonians, Philiscus set about collecting a large mercenary force in order to make war on the side of the Lacedaemonians. While these things were going on the second supporting force sent out by Dionysius arrived. And when the Athenians said that it ought to go to Thessaly to oppose the, the bands, while the Lacedaemonians urged that it should go to Laconia. The latter plan carried the day among the allies. Accordingly, after these troops from Dionysius had sailed round to Lacedaemon, Archidamus took them, along with his citizen soldiers, and set out on an expedition. He captured Carii by storm and put to the sword all whom he took prisoners. From there he marched at once with his united forces against the people of Parasia, in Arcadia, and laid waste their land. But when the Arcadians and Argives came to their assistance, he retired and encamped in the hills above Malia. While he was there Sisidas, the commander of the supporting force from Dionysius, said that the time for which he had been directed to stay had expired. And as soon as he had said this he departed by the road leading to Sparta. But when, as he was marching away, the Messenians tried to cut him off at a narrow place on the road, thereupon he sent to Archidamus and bade him come to his aid. And Archidamus did in fact do so. Then as soon as they all arrived at the branch road leading to the country of the Eutresians. There were the Arcadians and Argives advancing towards Laconia, they also having the intention of shutting off Archidamus from his homeward way. He accordingly, at just the point where there is a level space at the junction of the road leading to the Eutresians and the road to Malia, turned out of his path and formed his troops in line for battle. It is said that he also went along in front of the battalions and exhorted his men in the following words, Fellow citizens, let us now prove ourselves brave men and thus be able to look people in the face, let us hand on to those who come after us the fatherland as it was when we received it from our fathers, let us cease to feel shame before wives and children and elders and strangers, in whose eyes we used once to be the most highly honoured of all the Greeks. When these words had been spoken, it is said that from a clear sky there came lightnings and thunderings of favourable omen for him. And it chanced also that on the right wing was a sanctuary and a statue of Heracles. As a result, therefore, of all these things, it is reported that the soldiers were inspired with so much strength and courage that it was a task for their leaders to restrain them as they pushed forward to the front. And when Archidamus led the advance, only a few of the enemy waited till his men came within spear thrust, these were killed, and the rest were cut down as they fled, many by the horsemen and many by the Celts. Then as soon as the battle had ended and he had set up a trophy, he immediately sent home Demotels, the herald, to report the greatness of his victory and the fact that not so much as one of the Lacedaemonians had been slain, while vast numbers of the enemy had fallen. And when the people at Sparta heard this, it is said that all of them wept, beginning with the Gesilors, the senators, and the ephors, so true it is, indeed, that tears belong to joy and sorrow alike. On the other hand, both of the bands and the Aleans were almost as well pleased as the Lacedaemonians at the misfortune of the Arcadians, so vexed had they become by this time at their presumption. And now that the bands, who were continually planning how they might obtain the leadership of Greece, hit upon the idea that if they should send to the king of the Persians, they would gain some advantage in him. Thereupon they immediately summoned their allies, on the pretext that Euthycles, the Lacedaemonian, was also at the king's court, and there went up thither Pelopidas for the, the bands, Antiochus, the Pancratiast. For the Arcadians, and Archidamus for the Aleans, and Argive also went with them. And the Athenians, upon hearing of this, sent up Timagoras and Leon. When the ambassadors arrived there, Pelopidas enjoyed a great advantage with the Persian. For he was able to say that his people were the only ones among the Greeks who had fought on the side of the king at Plataea, that they had never afterwards undertaken a campaign against the king, and that the Lacedaemonians had made war upon them for precisely the reason that they had declined to go with the Gesilors against him and had refused to permit the Gesilors to sacrifice to Artemis at Aulis, the very spot where Agamemnon, 
at the time when he was sailing forth to Asia, had sacrificed before he captured Troy. It also contributed greatly toward the winning of honor for Pelopidas that the Thebans had been victorious in battle at Leuctra, and that they had admittedly ravaged the country of the Lacedaemonians. Pelopidas also said that the Argives and Arcadians had been defeated by the Lacedaemonians when the Thebans were not present with them. And the Athenian, Timagoras, bore witness in his behalf that all these things which he said were true, and so stood second in honor to Pelopidas. Pelopidas was therefore asked by the king what he desired to have written for him, he replied, that Messene should be independent of the Lacedaemonians and that the Athenians should draw up their ships on the land, that if they refused obedience in these points, the contracting parties were to make an expedition against them, and that if any city refused to join in such expedition, they were to proceed first of all against that city. When these things had been written and read to the ambassadors, Leon said in the king's hearing, By Zeus, Athenians, it is time for you, it seems, to be seeking some other friend instead of the king. And when the secretary had interpreted to the king what the Athenian had said, he again brought out a further writing, and if the Athenians are aware of anything juster than these provisions, let them come to the king and inform him. Now when the ambassadors had returned to their several homes, Timagoras was put to death by the Athenians on the complaint of Leon that he had refused to share quarters with him and had taken counsel in all matters with Pelopidas. As for the other ambassadors, Archidamus, the Aline, praised the doings of the king, because he had honoured Ellis above the Arcadians, but Antiochus, because the Arcadian League was less regarded, did not accept the royal gifts, and reported back to the ten thousand that the king had bakers, and cooks, and wine pourers, and doorkeepers in vast numbers, but as for men who could fight with Greeks, he said that though he sought diligently he could not see any. Besides this, he said that for his part he thought that the king's wealth of money was also mere pretense, for he said that even the golden plane tree, that was forever harped upon, was not large enough to afford shade for a grasshopper. When the Thebans had called together representatives from all the cities to hear the letter from the king. And the Persian who bore the document, having shown the king's seal, had read what was written therein, although the Thebans directed those who desired to be friends of the king and themselves to swear to these provisions, the representatives from the cities replied that they had not been sent to give their oaths, but to listen, and if the Thebans had any desire for oaths, they bade them send to the cities. Indeed the Arcadian, Lycomedes, said this besides, that it was not even proper for the congress to be held in Thebes, but rather at the seat of war, wherever it might be. Then, since the Thebans were angry with him and said that he was destroying the compact of alliance, he refused even to occupy a seat at the Congress, but took himself off, and with him went all the ambassadors from Arcadia. Accordingly, inasmuch as those who had come together refused to take the oath at Thebes, the Thebans sent ambassadors to the cities and directed them to swear that they would act in accordance with the king's letter. Believing that each one of the cities taken singly would hesitate to incur the hatred of themselves and the king at the same time. When, however, upon the arrival of the ambassadors at Corinth, their first stopping place, the Corinthians resisted the proposal, and replied that they had no desire for oaths shared with the king, then other cities also followed suit, giving their answers in the same terms. Thus it was that this attempt on the part of Pelopidas and the the bands to gain the leadership came to its end. Epaminondas, on the other hand, wishing to bring over the Achaeans to the side of the Thebans, in order that the Arcadians and the other allies might be more inclined to give heed to them, decided that he must march forth against Achaea. He therefore persuaded Pages, the Argive, who held the position of general at Argos, to occupy Onium in advance. And Pages, after he had learned that the guard over Onium was being maintained carelessly by Norkels, who commanded the mercenary troops of the Lacedaemonians. And by Timomarchus, the Athenian, did indeed seize the hill above century by night with two thousand hoplites, having provisions for seven days. Within this number of days that the bands arrived and crossed over Onium, and all the allies thereupon marched against Achaea, under the leadership of Epaminondas. Now upon the urgent entreaty which the aristocrats of Achaea addressed to him, Epaminondas effected through his personal influence an arrangement that their opponents were not to banish the aristocrats or to change the form of government, but after receiving pledges from the Achaeans that in very truth they would be allies and would follow wherever the, the bands led the way, he thereupon returned home. When, however, the Arcadians and the Achaean opposition brought against him the charge that he had arranged matters in Achaea in the interest of the Lacedaemonians and had then gone away, the the bands resolved to send governors to the Achaean cities. When they arrived they drove out the aristocrats. With the assistance of the commons, and established democracies in Achaea. 
but those who had been thus exiled speedily banded themselves together, proceeded against each one of the cities singly, and as they were not few in number, accomplished their restoration and gained possession of the cities. Then, since after their restoration they no longer followed a neutral course, but fought zealously in support of the Lacedaemonians, the Arcadians were hard-pressed by the Lacedaemonians on the one side and by the Achaeans on the other. As for Sicyon, its government up to this time had been in conformity with its ancient laws. But now Euphron, who had been the most powerful of the citizens in his influence with the Lacedaemonians and wished in like manner to stand first with their adversaries also, said to the Argives and to the Arcadians that if the richest men should remain in control of Sicyon, it was manifest that whenever an opportunity offered, the city would go over to the Lacedaemonians again. While if a democracy is established, be well assured, he said, that the city will remain true to you. If, therefore, you will be at hand to support me, I will be the one to call the people together, and I will not only give you in this act a pledge of my good faith, but will make the city steadfast in its alliance with you. This I do, you must understand, he said, because, like yourselves, I have long found the arrogance of the Lacedaemonians hard to endure, and I should be glad to escape from servitude to them. Accordingly the Arcadians and the Argives, upon hearing these words, gladly presented themselves to support him. Then he immediately called the people together in the marketplace in the presence of the Argives and the Arcadians, announcing that the government was to be on terms of full equality. When they had come together, he bade them choose whomsoever they saw fit as generals, and they chose Euphron himself, Hippodamus, Cleander, Acrisius, and Lysander. When this had been done, he also appointed Adias, his own son, to the command of the mercenary troops, removing Lysimenes, their former commander. And straightway Euphron made some of these mercenaries faithful to him by treating them generously, and took others into his pay, sparing neither the public nor the sacred funds. He likewise availed himself of the property of all those whom he banished for favouring the Lacedaemonians. Furthermore, he treacherously put to death some of his fellow officials and banished others, so that he brought everything under his control and was manifestly a tyrant and he managed to induce his allies to permit these proceedings of his, partly by the use of money, and partly by following with them zealously at the head of his mercenary force wherever they made an expedition. 2. When these matters had progressed to this point and the Argives had fortified Mount Tricarenum, above the Hareum, as a base of attack upon Flyas, while the Sicyonians were fortifying Thyamia on its borders. The Flyasians were exceedingly hard-pressed and suffered from lack of provisions. Nevertheless, they remained steadfast in their alliance. But I will speak further of them, for while all the historians make mention of the large states if they have performed any noble achievement, it seems to me that if a state which is small has accomplished many noble deeds, it is even more fitting to set them forth. Now the Flyasians had become friends of the Lacedaemonians at a time when they were greatest, and when they had been defeated in the battle at Leuctra, when many of the Perioesi had revolted from them and all the Helots also had revolted, and likewise their allies with the exception of a very few, and when all the Greeks, one might say, were in the field against them, the Flyasians remained steadfastly faithful, and, though they had as enemies the most powerful of the peoples in Peloponnesus, the Arcadians and Argives, nevertheless went to their assistance. Furthermore, when it fell to their lot to cross over to Pragii last of those who joined in the expedition, and these were the Corinthians, Epidorians, Troezenians, Hermionians, Halians, Sicyonians, and Pellenians, for at that time the last mentioned had not yet revolted from the Lacedaemonians, even when the Lacedaemonian leader went off with those who had crossed first and left the Flyasians, even so they did not turn back, but hired a guide from Pragii, and, although the enemy were in the neighbourhood of Amicle, slipped through as best they could and reached Sparta. And the Lacedaemonians, besides honouring them in other ways, sent them an ox as a gift of hospitality. Again, when the enemy had retired from Lacedaemon, and the Argives, in anger at the devotion of the Flyasians toward the Lacedaemonians, had invaded the territory of Flyas in full force and were laying waste their land, even then they did not yield, but when the Argives were withdrawing, after having destroyed as much as they could, the horsemen of the Flyasians sallied forth and followed after them, and although all the Argive horsemen and the companies posted behind them were employed to guard their rear. The Flyasians nevertheless, who were but sixty in number, attacked these troops and turned to flight the entire rearguard, to be sure they killed but few of them, yet they set up a trophy, with the Argives looking on, precisely as if they had killed them all. Once again, the Lacedaemonians and their allies were guarding Onium, and that the bands were approaching with the intention of crossing over the mountain. 
At this time, as the Arcadians and Alenes were marching through Nemea in order to effect a junction with the other bands, exiles of the Flyasians made them an offer that if they would only put in an appearance to help their party, they would capture Flyas, and when this plan had been agreed upon, during the night the exiles and others with them, about 600 in number, set themselves in ambush close under the wall with scaling ladders. Then as soon as the watchman signaled from Tricaranum that enemies were approaching, and the city was giving its attention to these last. At this moment those who sought to betray the city signaled to the people in ambush to climb up. When they had climbed up and found the posts of the guards weakly manned, they pursued the day guards, who numbered ten, for one out of each squad of five was regularly left behind as a day guard, and they killed one while he was still asleep and another after he had fled for refuge to the Hurium. And since the other day guards in their flight leaped down from the wall on the side looking toward the city, the men who had climbed up were in undisputed possession of the Acropolis. But when an outcry reached the city and the citizens came to the rescue, at first the enemy issued forth from the Acropolis and fought in the space in front of the gates which lead to the city, afterwards, being beset on all sides by those who came against them, they withdrew again to the Acropolis, and the citizens poured in with them. Now the space within the Acropolis was cleared at once. But the enemy mounted upon the wall and the towers and showered blows and missiles upon the people who were within. Meanwhile the latter defended themselves from the ground and attacked the enemy by the steps which led up to the wall. When, however, the citizens gained possession of some of the towers on this side and on that, they closed in desperate battle with those who had mounted upon their walls. And the enemy, as they were forced back by them, by their courage as well as by their fighting, were being crowded together into an ever smaller space. At this critical moment the Arcadians and Argives were circling around the city and beginning to dig through the wall of the Acropolis from its upper side, and as for the citizens within, some were dealing blows upon the people on the wall, others upon those who were still climbing up from the outside and were on the ladders, and still others were fighting against those among the enemy who had mounted upon the towers, they also found fire in the tents and began to set the towers ablaze. From below. Bringing up some sheaves which chanced to have been harvested on the Acropolis itself. Then the people upon the towers, in fear of the flames, jumped off one after another, while those upon the walls, under the blows of their human adversaries, kept falling off. And when they had once begun to give way, speedily the whole Acropolis had become bare of the enemy. Thereupon the horsemen straightway sallied forth from the city, and the enemy upon seeing them retired, leaving behind their ladders, their dead, and likewise some of the living who had been badly lamed and the number of the enemy who were killed, both in the fighting within and by leaping down without, was not less than eighty. Then one might have beheld the men congratulating one another with handclasps on their preservation, and the women bringing them drink and at the same time crying for joy. Indeed, laughter mingled with tears did on that occasion really possess all who were present. In the following year likewise the Argives and all the Arcadians invaded the territory of Flyas. The reason for their continually besetting the Flyasians was partly that they were angry with them. And partly that they had the country of the Flyasians between them, and were always in hope that through want of provisions they would bring them to terms. But on this invasion also the horsemen and the picked troops of the Flyasians, along with the horsemen of the Athenians who were present, attacked them at the crossing of the river, and having won the victory, they made the enemy retire under the heights for the rest of the day, just as if they were keeping carefully away from the corn in the plain as the property of friends, so as not to trample it down. On another occasion the Theban governor at Sicyon marched upon Flyas at the head of the garrison which he had under his own command, and of the Sicyonians and Polenians, for at that time they were already following the Thebans, and Euphron also took part in the expedition with his mercenaries, about two thousand in number. Now the main body of the troops descended along Tricaranum toward the Hurium with the intention of laying waste the plain. But the commander left the Sicyonians and Polenians behind upon the height over against the gates leading to Corinth, so that the Flyasians should not go around by that way and get above his men at the Hurium. When, however, the people in the city perceived that the enemy had set out for the plain, the horsemen and the picked troops of the Flyasians sallied forth against them, gave battle, and did not allow them to make their way to the plain. And they spent most of the day there in fighting at long range, the troops of Euphron pursuing up to the point where the country was suited for cavalry, and the men from the city as far as the Hurium. When, however, it seemed to be the proper time, the enemy retired by a circuitous route over Tricaranum, for the ravine in front of the wall prevented them from reaching the Polenians by the direct way. Then the Flyasians, after following them a little way up the hill, turned back and charged along the road which leads past the wall against the Polenians and those with them. 
and the troops of the the Ban general, upon perceiving the haste of the fly Asians, began racing with them in order to reach the Polinians first and give them aid. The horsemen, however, arrived first, and attacked the Polinians. And when at the outset they withstood the attack, the fly Asians fell back, but then attacked again in company with such of the foot soldiers as had come up, and fought hand to hand. At this the enemy gave way, and some of the Sicyonians fell and very many of the Polinians, and brave men, too. When these things had taken place the fly Asians set up a trophy, sounding their paean loudly, as was natural, and the troops of the Theban general and Euphron allowed all this to go on, just as if they had made their race to see a spectacle. Then, after these proceedings were finished, the one party departed for Sicyon and the other returned to the city. Another noble deed which the fly Asians performed was this, when they had made a prisoner of Proxenus. The Polinian, even though they were in want of everything, they let him go without a ransom. How could one help saying that men who performed such deeds were noble and valiant? Furthermore, that it was only by stout endurance that they maintained their fidelity to their friends is clearly manifest, for when they were shut off from the products of their land, they lived partly by what they could get from the enemy's territory, and partly by buying from Corinth, they went to the market through the midst of many dangers, with difficulty provided the price of supplies, with difficulty brought through the enemy's lines the people who fetched these supplies, and were hard put to it to find men who would guarantee the safety of the beasts of burden which were to convey them. At length, when they were in desperate straits, they arranged that chairs should escort their supply train. Upon his arrival at Flyus they begged him to help them also to convoy their non-combatants to Pelene. Accordingly they left these people at Pelene, and after making their purchases and packing as many beasts of burden as they could, they set off during the night, not unaware that they would be ambushed by the enemy, but thinking that to be without provisions was a more grievous thing than fighting. Now the fly Asians, together with chairs, went on ahead, and when they came upon the enemy they immediately set to work, and, cheering one another on, pressed their attack, while at the same time they shouted to chairs to come to their aid. And when victory had been achieved and the enemy driven out of the road, in this wise they brought home in safety both themselves and the supplies they were conveying. Now in Asmach as the fly Asians had passed the night without sleep, they slept until far on in the day. But when Chairs arose, the horsemen and the best of the hoplites came to him and said, Chairs, it is within your power today to accomplish a splendid deed. For the Sicyonians are fortifying a place upon our borders. And they have many builders but not very many hoplites. Now therefore we, the horsemen and the stoutest of the hoplites, will lead the way, and if you will follow us with your mercenary force, perhaps you will find the business already settled for you, and perhaps your appearance will turn the scale, as happened at Pelene. But if anything in what we propose is unacceptable to you, consult the gods by sacrifices, for we think that the gods will bid you do this even more urgently than we do. And this, chairs, you should well understand, that if you accomplish these things you will have secured a stronghold as a base of attack upon the enemy and have preserved a friendly city, and you will win the fairest of fame in your fatherland and be most renowned among both allies and enemies. Chairs accordingly was persuaded and offered sacrifice, while on the fly Asian side the horsemen straightway put on their breastplates and bridled their horses. And the hoplites made all the preparations necessary for infantry. When they had taken up their arms and were proceeding to the place where he was sacrificing, Chairs and the seer met them zero and said that the sacrifices were favorable. Wait for us, they said, for we, too, will set forth at zero once. And as soon as word had been given by the herald, Chairs' mercenaries also speedily rushed out with a kind of heaven-sent eagerness. Now when Chairs had begun to march, the cavalry and infantry of the fly Asians went on ahead of him, and at first they led the way rapidly, and then they began to run, finally, the horsemen were riding at the top of their speed and the foot soldiers were running as fast as it is possible for men in line to zero go, while after them came Chairs, following in Zast. The time was a little before sunset, and they found the enemy at the fortress, some bathing, some cooking, some kneading, and some making their beds. Now so soon as the enemy saw the vehemence of the onset they straightway fled in terror, leaving all their provisions behind for these brave men. The latter accordingly made their dinner off these provisions qnd more which came from home, and after pouring libations in honour of their good fortune, singing a paean, and posting guards, they went to sleep. And the Corinthians, after news had reached them during the night in regard to Thyamia, in a most friendly way ordered out by proclamation all their tecms and pack animals, loaded them with corn, and convoyed them to Flyus, and so long as the fortifications were building, convoys continued to be sent out every day. 
3. The story of the Fly Asians, then, how they proved themselves faithful to their friends and continued valiant in the war, and how, though in WQNT of everything, they remained steadfast in their alliance, has been told. At about this time Aeneas the Stymphalian, who had become general of the Arcadians, thinking that conditions in Sicyon were not to be endured, went up to the Acropolis with his own army, called together the aristocrats among the Sicyonians who were in the city, and sent after those who had been exiled there from without a decree of the people. And Euphron, seized with fear at these proceedings, fled for refuge to the port of the Sicyonians, and after summoning Pasimelus to come from Corinth, through him handed over the port to the Lacedaemonians and appeared once more in their alliance, saying that he had all the time remained faithful to the Lacedaemonians. For he said that at the same time when a vote was taken in the city as to whether the Sicyonians should decide to revolt from them, he, with a few others, voted against it, and that afterwards he had set up a democracy out of his desire to avenge himself on those who had betrayed him. And at this moment, he said, all who were traitors to you are in exile by my act. Now if I had found myself able, I should have gone over to you with the entire city. As it is, I have given over to you the port, over which alone I had gained control. Those who heard him say these words were many, but how many believed him is by no means clear. However, since I have begun it, I desire to finish the story of Euphron. When the aristocrats and the commons at Sicyon had fallen into strife, Euphron obtained a force of mercenaries from Athens and came back again. And with the help of the commons he was master of the town, of the band governor, however, held the Acropolis, and since Euphron realized that with the, the bands holding the Acropolis he could not possibly be master of the state, he got together money and set out with the intention of persuading the, the bands, by means of this money, to banish the aristocrats and give the state over to him again. When, however, the former exiles learned of his journey and his plans, they likewise proceeded to Thebes. And as they saw him in familiar association with the, the ban officials, they were seized with fear that he might accomplish what he wanted, and some of them took the risk and slew Euphron upon the Acropolis while the Zero officials and the Senate were in session there. But the officials brought those who had done the deed before the Senate and spoke as follows, fellow citizens. We arraign on the sapital charge these men who have slain Euphron. Seeing, as we do, that while right-minded men commit no unjust or unrighteous deed, and the wicked, although they commit them, strive to do them in secret, these persons have so far surpassed all mankind in hardihood and villainy that in the presence of the very magistrates and in the presence of you, who alone have authority to decide who shall die and who shall not, they took decision into their own hands and slew the man. Therefore if these men do not suffer the extreme penalty, who will ever have the courage to visit our city? And what will become of the city if any one who so desires is to be allowed to slay a man before he has made known for what purpose he has come here? We, then, arraign these men as utterly unrighteous, unjust, and lawless, and as having shown the utmost contempt for our city. It is for you, after you have heard, to inflict upon them such penalty as they seem to you to deserve. Such were the words of the officials. As for those who had slain you from, all except one denied that they had been the perpetrators of the deed, but one had admitted it, and began his defence in some such words as these, Surely, the bands, to feel contempt for you is not possible for a man if he knows that you have authority to do with him as you will, in what, then, did I trust when I here slew the man? Be well assured that it was first of all in the belief that I was doing a just deed, and secondly in the thought that you would decide rightly, for I knew that you likewise, in dealing with the party of Archias and Hypates, whom you found to have performed acts like those of Euphron, did not wait for a vote, but punished them as soon as you found yourselves able to do so, believing that those who are manifestly unrighteous and those who are plainly traitors and attempting to be tyrants, are already condemned to death by all mankind. Was not Euphron also, I ask, guilty under all these heads? In the first place, he found the shrines full of offerings both of silver and of gold, and left them empty of all these treasures. Again, who could be more manifestly a traitor than Euphron, who was the closest of friends to the Lacedaemonians and then chose you in their stead, and after he had given you pledges and received pledges from you, betrayed you again and handed over the port to your adversaries? Once again, was he not beyond question a tyrant, when he made slaves not only free me tilde but even citizens, and put to death and banished and robbed of property, not the people who were guilty of wrongdoing, but those whom it suited him to treat thus? And these were the better classes. Then after he had returned again to the city in company with your bitter adversaries, the Athenians. He set himself in arms against your governor, but since he found himself unable to expel him from the Acropolis, he got together money and came hither. 
now if he had been shown to have gathered armed forces with which to attack you, you would even feel grateful to me for slaying him, but zero when he provided himself with money instead, and came with the purpose of corrupting you by means of this money and persuading you to make him lord of the city again, how can I justly be put to death by you for inflicting upon the man his due punishment? For whereas those who are constrained by arms suffer damage, yet they are not thereby shown to be wicked at any rate, but those who are corrupted by money in violation of the right not only suffer damage, but at the same time incur shame. To be sure, if he had been an enemy of mine but a friend of yours, I admit myself that it would not have been seemly for me to slay this man in your city, but wherein was he, who was a zero traitor to you? More of an enemy to me than to you? But. By Zeus, someone might say, he came of his own free will. So, then, if anyone had slain him while he was keeping away from your city, he would have obtained praise, but as it is, when he came again to do more wrong in addition to what he had done before, does one say that he has not been slain justly? Where can such a one show that a truce exists between Greeks and traitors, or double deserters, or tyrants? Besides all this, remember also that you voted, and properly, that exiles should be subject to extradition from all the cities of the alliance. But as for an exile who returns without a general resolution of the allies, can anyone explain why it is unjust for such a one to be put to death? I maintain, gentlemen, that if you put me to death, you will have avenged a man who was the worst of all your enemies, but if you decide that I have done what was right, you will be found to have taken vengeance both for your own selves and for all the allies. But the bands, after hearing these words, decided that Euphron had met his deserts, his own citizens, however, esteeming him a good man, brought him home, buried him in their marketplace, and pay him pious honours as the founder of their city. So true it is, as it seems, that most people define as good men their own benefactors. For, the story of Euphron has been told, and I return to the point from which I digress to this subject. While, namely, the Flyasians were still fortifying Thyamia and Chairs were still with them, Oropus was seized by those who had been exiled therefrom. When, however, the Athenians had set out in full force against the city and had summoned Chairs from Thyamia, the port of the Sicyonians in its turn was recaptured by the citizens of Sicyon themselves and the Arcadians. As for the Athenians, none of their allies came to their assistance, and they retired and left Oropus in the possession of the Thebans pending a judicial decision. And now Lycomedes. Upon learning that the Athenians were finding fault with their allies because, while they were themselves suffering many troubles on their account, none gave them any assistance in return, persuaded the 10,000 to negotiate for an alliance with the Athenians. At first, indeed, some of the Athenians took it ill that, when they were friends of the Lacedaemonians, they should become allies of their adversaries, but when upon consideration they found that it was no less advantageous to the Lacedaemonians than to themselves that the Arcadians should not require the support of the Thebans, under these circumstances they accepted the alliance with the Arcadians. While Lycomedes was engaged in these negotiations, upon his departure from Athens he met his death by what was quite manifestly a divine interposition. For there were very many ships available and he selected from them the one he wanted and made an agreement with the sailors to land him wherever he should himself direct. And he chose to land at the very spot where the Arcadian exiles chanced to be. He, then, met his death in this way, but the alliance was really accomplished. Meantime Demotion said in the assembly of the Athenians that while it seemed to him a good thing to be negotiating this friendship with the Arcadians, they ought, he said, to give instructions to their generals to see to it that Corinth also should be kept safe for the Athenian people, and on hearing of this the Corinthians speedily sent adequate garrisons of their own to every place where Athenians were on guard and told the latter to depart, saying that they no longer had any need of garrisons. The men accordingly obeyed. And as soon as the Athenians had come together from their guard stations to the city of Corinth, the Corinthians made proclamation that if any of the Athenians had been wronged, they were to register their names, in the assurance that they would receive their just dues. While these matters were in this state, Chairs arrived at Century with a fleet. And when he learned what had been done, he said that he had heard there was plotting against the state and had come to give aid. The Corinthians, however, while they thanked him, were none the more disposed to admit his ships into their harbour, but bade him sail away, and they likewise sent away the hoplites after rendering them their just dues. It was in this way, then, that the Athenians departed from Corinth. On the other hand, they were bound by the terms of their alliance to send their cavalry to the aid of the Arcadians in case anyone took the field against Arcadia, but they did not set foot upon Laconia for the purpose of war. 
and now the Corinthians, in the thought that it would be difficult for them to come off safe, since even before this time they had been overmastered by land and now the Athenians had been added to the number of those who were unfriendly to them, resolved to collect mercenaries. Both infantry and cavalry. Once in command of these troops, they not only guarded their city but likewise inflicted much harm upon their enemies near home, but to Thebes they sent messengers to ask whether they could obtain peace if they came for it. And when the the bands bade them come, saying that peace would be granted, the Corinthians requested that they should allow them to go to their allies also, to the end that they might conclude the peace in company with those who desired peace, and leave those who preferred war to continue war. The the bands having permitted them to do this likewise, the Corinthians went to Lacedaemon and said, Men of Lacedaemon, we have come to you as your friends, and we ask that in case you see any safety for us if we persist in the war, you make it known to us, but in case you judge our situation to be hopeless, that you join with us in concluding peace if it is to your advantage also. For there is no one in the world along with whom we should more gladly gain safety than with you. If, however, you consider that it is to your advantage to continue the war, we beg you to allow us to conclude peace. For if we are saved, we might perhaps make ourselves useful to you again at some future time, whereas if we are now destroyed, it is plain that we shall never be of service in the future. Upon hearing these words the Lacedaemonians not only advised the Corinthians to conclude the peace, but gave permission to such of their other allies as preferred not to continue the war in company with them, to cease, as for themselves, however, they said that they would fight on and accept whatever fortune it pleased the deity to send, and that they would never submit to be deprived of what they had received from their fathers, Messene. So the Corinthians, upon hearing these words, proceeded to Thebes to make the peace. The the bands, however, wanted them to bind themselves to an alliance as well, but they replied that an alliance was not peace but an exchange of war, and they said that they had come to conclude a real peace, if the the bands so pleased. And the the bands, seized with admiration for them because, even though they were in peril, they refused to be involved in war with their benefactors, granted peace to them, to the Flyasians. And to those who had come with them to Thebes. With the condition that each party should keep its own territory. And on these terms the oaths were taken. Then the Flyasians, inasmuch as the compact had been concluded on this basis, at once withdrew from Thyamia, but the Argives, who had sworn to make peace on these same terms, when they found themselves unable to bring it about that the Flyasian exiles should remain at Tricoranum on the ground that they would be within their own state, took over the place and kept it garrisoned, claiming now that this territory, which a little while before they had been laying waste as though it were, an Ene, Ys, was theirs, and although the Flyasians proposed a judicial decision, they refused to grant the request. At about this time, the first Dionysius being now dead, his son sent to the aid of the Lacedaemonians twelve triremes and Timocrates as their commander. And upon his arrival he helped them to capture Celasia, and after accomplishing this deed he sailed back home. Not long after this the Aleans seized Larsion, which in ancient times had been theirs, but at present belonged to the Arcadian League. Sex Arcadians, however, did not let the matter pass, but at once called out their troops and went to the rescue. And on the side of the Aleans the 300 and likewise the 400 came out to meet them. Now after the Aleans had lain encamped on a somewhat level spot opposite the enemy throughout the day, the Arcadians climbed up by night to the summit of the mountain which was above the Aleans, and at daybreak they proceeded to descend upon the Aleans. Then the latter, seeing that the Arcadians were not only approaching from higher ground but were also many times their number, were yet ashamed to retreat while still at a distance, but advanced to meet the enemy, and took to flight only after letting them come to close quarters, and they lost many men and many arms, since they retreated over difficult ground. When the Arcadians had accomplished these things, they proceeded against the cities of the Acrorians. And having captured them, with the exception of Thraustus, they arrived at Olympia, and after building a stockade around the hill of Cronus, kept guard there and were masters of the Olympian mountain, they likewise gained possession of Margana, which was betrayed to them by some of its citizens. When matters had progressed to this point, the Aleans fell back into complete despondency, while the Arcadians proceeded against their capital. And they advanced as far as the marketplace, there, however, the horsemen and the rest of the Aleans made a stand, and they drove the Arcadians out, killed some of them, and set up a trophy. Now there had been dissension in Elis even before this time. For the party of Chaopus, Thrasanidas, and Argeus were trying to convert the state into a democracy, and the party of Ualcas, Hippias, and Stratilas into an oligarchy. But when the Arcadians with a large force seemed to be allies of those who wished to have a democracy, Thereupon the party of Chaopus were bolder, and after making arrangements with the Arcadians to aid them, seized the Acropolis. 
The horsemen, however, and the 300 made no delay, but at once marched up and ejected them, so that about 400 of the citizens, with Argeus and Charopus, were banished. Not long afterwards these exiles enlisted the aid of some of the Arcadians and seized Pylos. And many of the Democrats withdrew from the capital and joined them, in as they were in possession of a good stronghold and had a large force, that of the Arcadians, to support them. Afterwards the Arcadians invaded the territory of the Aleans again, being persuaded by the exiles that the city would come over to them. But on that occasion the Achaeans, who had become friends of the Aleans, defended their city successfully, so that the Arcadians retired without accomplishing anything more than the laying waste of the land of the Elia Tilda S. At the moment, however, when they were departing from the Aleans territory, they learned that Zero the Pelenians were in Elis, and after making an exceedingly long march by night seized their town of Olyrus, for by this time the Pelenians had come back again to their alliance with the Lacedaemonians. Now when the Pelenians learned the news in regard to Olyrus, they in their turn made a roundabout march and as best they could got into their own city, Pelene. And after this they carried on war not only with the Arcadians at Olyrus, but also with the entire body of the Democrats of their own state, although they were themselves very few in number, but nevertheless they did not cease until they had captured Olyrus by siege. The Arcadians on their side made yet another expedition into Elis. And while they were encamped between Selene and the capital, the Aleans made an attack upon them, but the Arcadians stood their ground and defeated them. Then Andromachus, the Aleane commander of horse. The man who was thought to be responsible for having joined battle. Killed himself, but the rest retired to the city. Among those who perished in this battle was also Socles the Spartiate, who had meanwhile arrived, for by this time the Lacedaemonians were allies of the Aleans. And now the Aleans, being hard pressed in their own land, sent ambassadors and asked the Lacedaemonians also to take the field against the Arcadians, believing that the Arcadians would be most likely to give up the struggle in this event, that is, if they were beset by war from both sides. As a result of this request, Archidamus took the field with the citizen troops and seized Cromnus. And after leaving in the town as a garrison three of the twelve battalions, he then returned homewards. But the Arcadians, gathered together as they were in consequence of their expedition into Elis, came to the rescue and surrounded Cromnus with a double stockade, and, being thus in a safe position, besieged the people in Cromnus. Then the city of Lacedaemon, distressed at the besieging of its citizens, sent out an army. And on this occasion also Archidamus was in command. When he had come, he laid waste as much as he could both of Arcadia and of Syritis, and did everything in order, if possible, to draw off the besiegers. The Arcadians, however, were not any more disposed to stir than before, but disregarded all these doings. Then Archidamus, espying a hill over which the Arcadians had carried their outer stockade, came to the conclusion that he could capture it, and that if he became master of this hill, the besiegers at its foot would not be able to hold their position. Now while he was leading the way to this place by a roundabout route, as soon as the Peltastes who were running on ahead of Archidamus caught sight of the Eperitae outside the stockade, they attacked them, and the cavalry endeavoured to join in the attack. The enemy, however, did not give way, but forming themselves into a compact body, remained quiet. Then the Lacedaemonians attacked again. The enemy did not give way even then, but on the contrary proceeded to advance, and by this time there was a deal of shouting, Archidamus himself thereupon came to the rescue, turning off along the wagon road which runs to Cromnus and leading his men in double file, just as he chanced to have them formed. Now as soon as the two forces had come near to one another, the troops of Archidamus in column, since they were marching along a road, and the Arcadians massed together in close order, at this juncture the Lacedaemonians were no longer able to hold out against the superior weight of the Arcadians, but Archidamus speedily received a wound straight through his thigh and speedily those who fought in front of him kept falling, among them Polyenidas and Chilon. Who was married to the sister of Archidamus? And the whole number of them who fell at that time was not less than thirty. But when the Lacedaemonians as they retired along the road came out into open ground, they immediately formed themselves in line of battle against the enemy. The Arcadians on their side stood in close order, just as they were, and while inferior in numbers, they were in better spirits by far, since they had attacked a foe who retreated and had killed men. The Lacedaemonians, on the other hand, were exceedingly despondent, for they saw that Archidamus was wounded and they had heard the names of the dead, who were not only brave men but well nigh their most distinguished. But when, the Arcadians being now close at hand, one of the older men shouted out and said, Why, sirs, should we fight, and not rather make a truce and become reconciled? 
both sides heard him gladly and made a truce. Accordingly the Lacedaemonians took up their dead and departed. While the Arcadians returned to the place where they had originally begun to advance. And there set up a trophy. While the Arcadians were occupied about Cromnus, the Aleans in the capital proceeded in the first place against Pylus, and fell in with the Pylians after the latter had been driven out of Thalami. And when the horsemen of the Aleans, as they rode along, caught sight of the Pylians, they did not delay, but attacked at once, and they killed some of them, while others fled for refuge to a hill, but as soon as the infantry came up they dislodged those upon the hill also, and killed some of them on the spot and took captive others, nearly two hundred in number. Thereupon they sold all among the prisoners who were foreigners and put to the sword all who were Aleen exiles. After this the Aleans not only captured the Pylians, along with their stronghold, in Asmuch as no one came to their aid, but also recovered Margana. As for the Lacedaemonians, they afterwards went against Cromnus again by night. Made themselves masters of the stockade which was opposite the Argives. And immediately proceeded to call forth the Lacedaemonians who were besieged there. Now all who chanced to be nearest at hand and seized the opportunity promptly, came forth, but such as were forestalled by a large body of the Arcadians which came to the rescue, were shut off inside the stockade, captured, and distributed. And the Argives received one portion, the the bands one, the Arcadians one, and the Messenians one. And the whole number who were captured of the Spartiate and the Perioesi came to more than one hundred. When the Arcadians were no longer occupied with Cromnus, they occupied themselves again with the Aleans, and they not only kept Olympia more strongly garrisoned, but also, since an Olympic year was coming on, prepared to celebrate the Olympic Games in company with the Pisatans, who say that they were the first to have charge of the sanctuary. But when the month came in which the Olympic Games take place and the days on which the festal assembly gathers, at this time the Aleans, after making their preparations openly and summoning the Achaeans to their aid, proceeded to march along the road leading to Olympia. Now the Arcadians had never imagined that the Aleans would come against them and were themselves directing the festal meeting in company with the Pisatans. They had already finished the horse race and the events of the pentathlon held in the race course. And the competitors who had reached the wrestling were no longer in the race course but were wrestling in the space between the race course and the altar. For the Aleans, under arms, had by this time reached the sacred precinct. Then the Arcadians, without advancing to meet them, four, ed in line of battle on the river Cladors, which flows past the Altis and empties into the Alpheus. They had allies also to support them, about two thousand hoplites of the Argives and about four hundred horsemen of the Athenians. And the Aleans formed in line on the opposite side of the river. And, after offering sacrifice, immediately advanced. And although in former time they had been despised in matters of war by the Arcadians and Argives, and despised by the Achaeans and Athenians, nevertheless on that day they led their allies forward, as men who were unexcelled in valour, and they not only routed the Arcadians at once, for it was these whom they encountered first, but withstood the attack of the Argives when they came to the rescue, and won the victory over them also. When, however, they had pursued the enemy to the space between the Senate House and the Temple of Hestia and the theatre which adjoins these buildings. Although they fought no less stoutly and kept pushing the enemy towards the altar, still, since they were pelted from the roofs of the porticos, the senate house, and the great temple, and were themselves fighting on the ground level, some of the Aleans were killed, among them Stratilus himself, the leader of the three hundred. When this happened, they retired to their own camp. But the Arcadians and those with them were so fearful for the coming day that they did not so much as go to rest during the night, being engaged in cutting down the carefully constructed booths and building a stockade. As for the Aleans, when they returned on the next day and saw that the stockade was a strong one and that many men had climbed up on the temples, they withdrew to their city, having shown themselves such men in point of valour as a god no doubt could produce by his inspiration even in a day. But human creatures could not make even in a long time out of those who were not valiant. Now while the leaders of the Arcadians were using the sacred treasures, and therefrom maintaining the Epiritae, the Mantineans were the first to pass a vote not to make use of the sacred treasures. For themselves, they collected in their city the amount which fell to their share towards the payment of the Epiritae and sent it off to the leaders. The leaders, however, said that they were doing harm to the Arcadian League, and summoned their rulers before the ten thousand, and when they refused to heed the summons, they passed sentence upon them and sent the Epiritae to bring those who had been thus condemned. Then the Mantineans shut their gates and would not admit the Epiritae within their walls. As a result of this some others likewise were soon saying in the meeting of the ten thousand that they ought not to use the sacred treasures, or to leave to their children for all time such an offence in the eyes of the gods. 
when, accordingly, a vote had been passed in the Arcadian Assembly not to make use of the sacred treasures any longer. Those who could not belong to the Eparitae without pay speedily began to melt away, while those who could, spurred on one another and began to enroll themselves in the Eparitae, in order that they might not be in the power of that body, but rather that it might be in their power. Then such of the Arcadian leaders as had H called the sacred treasures, realizing that, if they had to render an account, they would be in danger of being put to death, sent to Thebes and explained to the the bands that if they did not take the field, the Arcadians would be likely to go over to the Lacedaemonians again. The the bands accordingly prepared to take the field, but those who sought the best interests of Peloponnesus persuaded the general assembly of the Arcadians to send ambassadors and tell the the bands not to come under arms to Arcadia unless they sent them a summons. And while they said this to the the bands, at the same time they reasoned that they had no desire for war. For they held that they had no desire for the presidency of the shrine of Zeus. But that they would be acting more justly as well as more righteously if they gave it back, and that in this way, as they supposed, they would please the god better. Now since the Aleans also were desirous of this course, both parties resolved to make peace, and a truce was concluded. Islestone ED equals P unit equals para, after the oaths had been taken and, besides all the rest, the Tegeans had sworn and the the band governor himself, who chanced to be in Tegea with three hundred hoplites of the Boeotians, then, while the bulk of the Arcadians, still remaining there in Tegea, feasted and made merry, poured libations and sang paeans over the conclusion of peace, the the band and such of the Arcadian leaders as were fearful about their accounts, after closing sex gates in the Wall of Tegea with the help of the Boeotians and their partisans among the Eparitae, sent to the feasters and proceeded to seize the aristocrats. But inasmuch as the Arcadians of all the cities were present and all of them were desirous of having peace. Those who were seized were necessarily many, so that their prison was speedily full, and the city hall likewise. Since, however, there were many who had been imprisoned, and many who had leaped down outside the wall, and some also who had been let out through the gates, for no one, unless he expected to be put to death, felt resentment against anyone else, it was a cause of the greatest embarrassment to the the band governor and those who were acting with him in this matter that of the Mantineans, whom they most wanted to capture, they had but a very few, for because their city was nearby. Almost all of them had gone home. Now when day came and the Mantineans learned what had been done, they straightway sent to the other Arcadian cities and gave them word to hold themselves under arms and to guard the passes. The Mantineans likewise followed this course themselves, and at the same time, sending to Tegea, demanded back all the men of Mantinea whom they were holding there. And they said that they demanded in the case of the other Arcadians also that no one of them should be kept in prison or put to death without a trial. And if anyone had any charges to bring against these men, they gave assurances that the city of Mantinea pledged itself in very truth to produce before the general assembly of the Arcadians all whom anyone might summon to trial. That the ban accordingly, on hearing this, was at a loss to know how he should deal with the matter, and released all the men. Then on the following day he called together as many of the Arcadians as chose to gather and said in his defence that he had been deceived. For he had heard, he said, that the Lacedaemonians were on the borders under arms and that some of the Arcadians were going to betray Tegea to them. Upon hearing this they acquitted him, although they knew that he was speaking falsely about them, but they sent ambassadors to Thebes and brought charges against him saying that he ought to be put to death. It was said, however, that Epaminondas, for he chanced to be general at that time, urged that he had acted far more rightly when he seized the men than when he released them. For, he said to the ambassadors, it was on your account that we entered upon war, and you concluded peace without our approval, should we not, therefore, be justified in charging you with treason for this act. But be well assured, said he, that we shall make an expedition to Arcadia and shall wage war in company with those who hold to our side. 5. When these things were reported back to the general assembly of the Arcadians and to the several cities, the Mantineans and such of the other Arcadians as were concerned for Peloponnesus inferred therefrom, as did likewise the Aleans and the Achaeans, that the the bands manifestly wanted Peloponnesus to be as weak as possible so that they might as easily as possible reduce it to slavery. For why in the world, they said. Do they wish us to make war unless it is in order that we may do harm to one another and consequently may both feel the need of them? Or why? When we say that we do not at present need them, are they preparing to march forth? Is it not clear that it is for the purpose of working some harm upon us that they are preparing to take the field? 
and they sent to Athens also, bidding the Athenians come to their aid, while ambassadors from the Epirite proceeded to Lacedaemon as well, to invite the help of the Lacedaemonians in case they wanted to join in checking any who might come to enslave Peloponnesus. As for the matter of the leadership, they arranged at once that each people should hold it while within its own territory. While these things were being done, Epaminondas was on his outward march at the head of all the Boeotians, the Euboeans, and many of the Thessalians, who came both from Alexander and from his opponents. The Phocians, however, declined to join the expedition, saying that their agreement was to lend aid in case anyone went against Thebes, but that to take the field against others was not in the agreement. Epaminondas reflected, however, that his people had supporters in Peloponnesus also, the Argives, the Messenians, and such of the Arcadians as held to their side. These were the Tegeans, the Megalopolitans, the Arceans, the Palantians, and whatever cities were constrained to adopt this course for the reason that they were small and surrounded by these others. Epaminondas accordingly pushed forth with speed, but when he arrived at Nemea he delayed there, hoping to catch the Athenians as they passed by, and estimating that this would be a great achievement, not only in the view of his people's allies, so as to encourage them, but also in that of their opponents, so that they would fall into despondency, in a word, that every loss the Athenians suffered was a gain for the the bands. And during this delay on his part all those who held the same views were gathering together at Mantinea. But when Epaminondas heard that the Athenians had given up the plan of proceeding by land and were preparing to go by sea, with the intention of marching through Lacedaemon to the aid of the Arcadians, under these circumstances he set forth from Nemea and arrived at Tegea. Now I for my part could not say that his campaign proved fortunate, yet of all possible deeds of forethought and daring the man seems to me to have left not one undone. For, in the first place, I commend his pitching his camp within the wall of Tegea, where he was in greater safety than if he had been encamped outside, and where whatever was being done was more entirely concealed from the enemy. Furthermore, it was easier for him, being in the city, to provide himself with whatever he needed. Since the enemy, on the other hand, was encamped outside, it was possible to see whether they were doing things rightly or were making mistakes. Again, while he believed that he was stronger than his adversaries, he could never be induced to attack them when he saw that they held the advantage in position. However, when he perceived that no city was coming over to him and that time was passing on, he decided that some action must be taken, otherwise, in place of his former fame, he must expect deep disgrace. When he became aware, therefore, that his adversaries had taken up a strong position in the neighborhood of Mantinea and were sending after Agesilaus and all the Lacedaemonians, and learned, further, that Agesilaus had marched forth and was already at Pelene, he gave orders to his men to get their dinner and led his army straight upon Sparta. And had not a Cretan by a kind of providential chance come and reported to Agesilaus that the army was advancing, he would have captured the city, like a nest entirely empty of its defenders. But when Agesilaus, having received word of this in time, had got back to the city ahead of the enemy, the Spartiati posted themselves at various points and kept guard. Although they were extremely few, for all their horsemen were away in Arcadia and likewise the mercenary force and three of the battalions, which numbered twelve. Now when Epaminondas had arrived within the city of the Spartiati, he did not attempt to enter at the point where his troops would be likely to have to fight on the ground level and be pelted from the housetops, nor where they would fight with no advantage over the few, although they were many, but after gaining the precise position from which he believed that he would enjoy an advantage, he undertook to descend, instead of ascending, into the city. As for what happened thereupon, one may either hold the deity responsible, or one may say that nobody could withstand desperate men. For when Archidamus led the advance with not so much as a hundred men and, after crossing the very thing which seemed to present an obstacle, marched uphill against the adversary, at that moment the fire breathers. The men who had defeated the Lacedaemonians. The men who were altogether superior in numbers and were occupying higher ground besides, did not withstand the attack of the troops under Archidamus, but gave way. And those in the van of Epaminondas army were slain, but when the troops from within the city, exulting in their victory, pursued farther than was fitting, they in their turn were slain, for, as it seems, the line had been drawn by the deity indicating how far victory had been granted them. Archidamus accordingly set up a trophy at the spot where he had won the victory, and gave back under a truce those of the enemy who had fallen there. Epaminondas, on the other hand, reflecting that the Arcadians would be coming to Lacedaemon to bring aid, had no desire to fight against them and against all the Lacedaemonians after they had come together, especially since they had met with success and his men with disaster, so he marched back as rapidly as he could to Tegea, and allowed his hoplites to rest there. 
but sent his horsemen on to Mantinea. Begging them to endure this additional effort and explaining to them that probably all the cattle of the Mantineans were outside the city and likewise all the people, particularly as it was harvest time. They then set forth, but the Athenian horsemen, setting out from Eleusis, had taken dinner at the Isthmus and, after having passed through Cleone also, chanced to be approaching Mantinea or to be already quartered within the wall in the houses. And when the enemy were seen riding toward the city, the Mantineans begged the Athenian horsemen to help them, if in any way they could, for outside the wall were all their cattle and the laborers, and likewise many children and older men of the free citizens. When the Athenians heard this they sallied forth to the rescue, although they were still without breakfast, they and their horses as well. Here, again, who would not admire the valor of these men also? For although they saw that the enemy were far more numerous, and although a misfortune had befallen the horsemen at Corinth. They took no account of this, nor of the fact that they were about to fight with the, the bands and the Thessalians, who were thought to be the best of horsemen, but rather, being ashamed to be at hand and yet render no service to their allies, just as soon as they saw the enemy they crashed upon them, eagerly desiring to win back their ancestral repute. And by engaging in the battle they did indeed prove the means of saving for the Mantineans everything that was outside the wall, but there fell brave men among them, and those also whom they slew were manifestly of a like sort, for neither side had any weapon so short that they did not reach one another therewith. And the Athenians did not abandon their own dead, and they gave back some of the enemies under a truce. As for Epaminondas, on the other hand, when he considered that within a few days it would be necessary for him to depart, because the time fixed for the campaign had expired and that if he should leave behind him unprotected the people to whom he had come as an ally. They would be besieged by their adversaries, while he himself would have completely tarnished his own reputation. For with a large force of hoplites he had been defeated at Lacedaemon by a few, and defeated likewise in a cavalry battle at Mantinea, and through his expedition to Peloponnesus had made himself the cause of the union of the Lacedaemonians, the Arcadians, the Achaeans, the Aleans, and the Athenians. He thought for these reasons that it was not possible for him to pass by the enemy without a battle, since he reasoned that if he were victorious, he would make up for all these things, while if he were slain, he deemed that such an end would be honorable for one who was striving to leave to his fatherland dominion over Peloponnesus. Now the fact that Epaminondas himself entertained such thoughts, seems to me to be in no wise remarkable. For such thoughts are natural to ambitious men, but that he had brought his army to such a point that the troops flinched from no toil, whether by night or by day, and shrank from no peril, and although the provisions they had were scanty, were nevertheless willing to be obedient, this seems to me to be more remarkable. For at the time when he gave them the last order to make ready, saying that there would be a battle, the horsemen eagerly whitened their helmets at his command, the hoplites of the Arcadians painted clubs upon their shields, as though they were the bands, and all alike sharpened their spears and daggers and burnished their shields. But when he had led them forth, thus made ready, it is worthwhile again to note what he did. In the first place, as was natural, he formed them in line of battle. And by doing this he seemed to make it clear that he was preparing for an engagement, but when his army had been drawn up as he wished it to be. He did not advance by the shortest route towards the enemy. But led the way towards the mountains which lie to the westward and over against Aegea, so that he gave the enemy the impression that he would not join battle on that day. For as soon as he had arrived at the mountain, and when his battle line had been extended to its full length, he grounded arms at the foot of the heights, so that he seemed like one who was encamping and by so doing he caused among most of the enemy a relaxation of their mental readiness for fighting, and likewise a relaxation of their readiness as regards their array for battle. It was not until he had moved along successive companions to the wing where he was stationed, and had wheeled them into line thus strengthening the mass formation of this wing, that he gave the order to take up arms and led the advance, and his troops followed. Now as soon as the enemy saw them unexpectedly approaching, no one among them was able to keep quiet, but some began running to their posts, others forming into line. Others bridling horses. And others putting on breastplates, while all were like men who were about to suffer, rather charmed to inflict, harm. Meanwhile Epaminondas led forward his army prow on, like a trireme, believing that if he could strike and cut through anywhere, he would destroy the entire army of his adversaries. For he was preparing to make the contest with the strongest part of his force, and the weakest part he had stationed far back, knowing that if defeated it would cause discouragement to the troops who were with him and give courage to the enemy. Again, while the enemy had formed their horsemen like a phalanx of hoplites. Six deep and without intermingled foot soldiers. 
Epaminondas on the other hand HQD made a strong column of his cavalry, also, and had mingled foot soldiers among them, believing that when he cut through the enemy's cavalry, he would have defeated the entire opposing army, for it is very hard to find men who will stand firm when they see any of their own side in flight. And in order to prevent the Athenians on the left wing from coming to the aid of those who were posted next to them, he stationed both horsemen and hoplites upon some hills over against them, desiring to create in them the fear that if they proceeded to give aid, these troops would fall upon them from behind. Thus, then, he made his attack, and he was not disappointed of his hope, for by gaining the mastery at the point where he struck, he caused the entire army of his adversaries to flee. When, however, he had himself fallen, those who were left proved unable to take full advantage thereafter even of the victory. But although the opposing phalanx had fled before them, their hoplites did not kill a single man or advance beyond the spot where the collision had taken place, and although the cavalry also had fled before them, their cavalry in like manner did not pursue and kill either horsemen or hoplites, but slipped back timorously, like beaten men, through the lines of the flying enemy. Furthermore, while the intermingled footmen and the peltastes, who had shared in the victory of the cavalry, did make their way like victors to the region of the enemy's left wing, most of them were there slain by the Athenians. When these things had taken place, the opposite of what all men believed would happen was brought to pass. For since well nigh all the people of Greece had come together and formed themselves in opposing lines, there was no one who did not suppose that if a battle were fought, those who proved victorious would be the rulers and those who were defeated would be their subjects. But the deity so ordered it that both parties set up a trophy as though victorious and neither tried to hinder those who set them up. That both gave back the dead under a truce as though victorious, and both received back their dead under a truce as though defeated, and that while each party claimed to be victorious, neither was found to be any better off, as regards either additional territory, or city, or sway, than before the battle took place, but there was even more confusion and disorder in Greece after the battle than before. Thus far be it written by me, the events after these will perhaps be the concern of another.